Happy, happy Thursday, guys. Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Maurice Carney. He is the co-founder of Friends of the Congo. Welcome, Maurice. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Pleasure to be on with you. All right. So, Maurice, um, I have discussed uh, the genocide in the Congo uh, once before on the show. Margaret Kimberly from Black Agenda Report came on to talk a little bit about it. But she told me during that interview that you actually have spent a lot of time there and you can go a little bit deeper. I think I want to start from the very beginning, because a lot of us are aware of the genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza but more and more people that I talk to have made it clear to me that they had no idea about mm. the genocide that's happening in the Congo. Could we start from the very beginning? Could you explain to everyone how did this start to take place in the first place? Sure. Uh, the, the most recent, uh, the most recent uh, uh, atrocities that have been committed in the Congo uh, really got to start in, uh, in 1996. And it's a product of the Rwandan genocide from 1994, where those who committed the genocide in Rwanda across the border into the Congo and uh, the triumphant ones uh, coming out of the genocide, uh, led by uh, Paul Kagame, uh, the current president of, of Rwanda, pursued uh, those uh, who were responsible for the, the genocide in, 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 Rwanda, in Rwanda. And he did this uh, by crossing into, into the Congo. It was then called Zaire. And uh, not only did he uh, pursue uh, those responsible for the genocide, but he also went after uh, men, uh, women, children, the sick. Uh, and this happened in 1996. Uh, he invaded the Congo in uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Uganda, Yari Museveni, Uganda, uh, also Burundi. And at the time, Angola uh, took part uh, in that uh, in that invasion, and ostensibly the invasion would overthrow uh, the longtime dictators and backed by the United States, uh, Joseph uh, Desiree Mobutu. And so, so you uh, said, uh, just want to interject for just a second. You said a lot of times this has been backed by the United States government. No, the 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 uh, actually the overthrow of Lumumba. I mean, of, of Mobutu. Uh, Mobutu was backed by the United States uh, for over three decades. After the United States mounted the largest covert action in the world in the 1960s to uh, overthrow and assassinate Congo's first democratically elected prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, uh, then the United States went on to install a dictatorship over the Congolese people for three decades. Now, when the United States, and that dictatorship was headed up by Joseph Desiree Mobutu, uh, who was uh, an agent of the CIA, uh, was on the CIA's payroll initially, and uh, then uh, he uh, became uh, president of the the Congo when the United States installed him. And they made, not only did they install him, uh, but they maintained him in power for over three decades. Uh, A recent book uh, that just came out that lays this out pretty good, as a book called The Lumumba Plot. And The Lumumba Plot is written by a gentleman by the name of Stuart Reed. And uh, he goes on to make the argument that the conditions that we see the Congo in today, the United States is directly responsible uh, because it was the United States that installed the dictatorship that ran the country into the ground. And whenever the Congolese rose up, 
to get rid of the dictatorship, then the U.S. would go in and crush uh, the, the dissent. Now, so that's uh, that's another example of the U.S. government intervening in, in foreign countries. Oh, absolutely. It, it comes, uh, a lot of people, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people know about the role the U.S. played in overthrowing Mossadegh in Iran or Allende in Chile, you know, you know or uh, even uh, the overthrow of the leader in, uh, in Guatemala. But interestingly enough, people do not put the Congo in there. And the Congo probably stands uh, head and shoulders above those uh, other uh, overthrows of democratically elected leaders by the CIA. Uh, reason being because the Congo was so destroyed uh, as a result of the overthrow of, uh, of Lumumba. And because uh, in, in, the, uh, in his book, uh, Chief of Station Congo, uh, the Larry Devlin, who was the chief of the station, chief of station, the CIA chief of station in the Congo, who was re primarily responsible for the overthrow of Lumumba, uh, he said that, uh, not only uh, said that we had to overthrow Lumumba, because if we didn't overthrow Lumumba, not only would we have lost Congo, we would have lost all of Africa. See, both the enemies of Africa and the friends of Africa are clear about the centrality of Congo for the future of the African continent. Uh, because of its strategic location in the heart of the African continent, uh, because of its uh, its size, uh, it is uh, one of the largest countries on the on the continent, the second largest in terms of area, fourth largest in terms of population. Uh, it's the size of Western Europe, uh, and it's uh, spectacularly wealthy, arguably uh, the richest uh, country uh, uh, on the planet in terms of natural resources. Uh, economists say there's some 24 trillion dollars of natural resources uh, in the Congo. Uh, and, and Krumah, uh, at the time in the 1960s, uh, he actually wrote a book about the Congo and the centrality of the Congo to Africa called The Challenge of Congo. Uh, because, you, you know, and Krumah had the project of the United States of Africa. And he uh, had an agreement with Patrice Lumumba that uh, Congo would serve as the capital and certainly the industrial engine that would drive uh, the development of the African continent. So the CIA's overthrow of, uh, of Lumumba and then subsequent installation of Mobutu wasn't uh, disa solely disastrous for the Congo, but uh, for the promise of Africa as well. So the U.S. had in installed this dictator for over three decades. And by the end of the Cold War, uh, you found that there are demo democracy, democratic movements uh, popping up throughout the continent. And the same happened in the Congo, where they had what they call national sovereign conferences, where the a bottom-up democratic movement to remove this dictator, uh, Mobutu, that was backed by the United States. So instead of the United States uh, embracing uh, the uh, democratic movement in the Congo at the time, uh, what they did was they decided to back an invasion of the Congo. And that's where Paul Kagame uh, of Rwanda and Yari Museveni of Uganda come into play. Uh, the United States uh, armed them, financed them, trained them, provided intelligence uh, uh, for them as they invaded the Congo the first time in 1996, and they overthrew uh, the U.S.-backed uh, dictator Mobutu. He was getting old, he was getting sick, and the U.S. Uh, was, get, was ready to get rid of them. Uh, but they didn't want anybody to assume power, and they certainly didn't want a popular leader that they couldn't control. And if the democratic movement was to, allowed to uh, have its way in the Congo in the early 1990s, uh, then they surely would have uh, elected a leader that the United States uh, did not control. You see, after the U.S. Uh, overthrew Lumumba and installed Mobutu, every leader right up to this day that has arisen to the highest office in the Congo has had to have the sign-off, uh, the imprimatur of the United States. Um, so the United States has been deeply involved, whether it was uh, the overthrow and assassination of Lumumba, the installation and maintenance of the dictatorship of uh, Joseph Desiree Mobutu, or the backing of the invasion of the Congo in 1996 by Rwanda and Uganda. So they successfully, in, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this kind of reminds me of Libya. Uh, remember when uh, Libya started to have uh, more of a, become more of a, a democratic when they actually developed more of a democracy. All of a sudden, Barack Obama said, we have to get rid of Gaddafi. That's, yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah, certainly, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the U.S.'s aim is to 
whether in Africa or throughout the, the globe, is full spectrum domination. And if there's a threat to that, any regional threat, then they squash it. Uh, you see, Gaddafi uh, was the leading proponent for Pan-Africanism, uh, a unified African continent that would have its own currency, its own uh, communications infrastructure, its own uh, military. All, it, that it was fast. He wanted to fast track the uh, unification of the African continent, and he had the the resources to back it up. He was the largest donor uh, to the to the African Union. Uh, a tremendous amount of wealth uh, that he could put behind uh, an African currency, uh, whether you're talking about gold or the oil wealth that he had. So it's not in the interest of the, the United States to have any strong power on the African continent. And that's part of the reason why the Congo has been kept so weak, because the Congolese, uh, progressive Congolese in the, uh, the Il of the Ilk of Lumumba, where to control the, the wealth that's in the Congo, uh, where economists say there's some $24 trillion worth of natural wealth. I don't know if that's true. I question it, the methodology and all. But the fact that you can say that much, say, make that kind of a statement about the country, lets you know it's, it's spectacularly wealthy. Uh, in addition to that, it's, it's got critical minerals uh, that are vital to U.S. national security. We're talking about cobalt. We're talking about uh, coltan. We're talking about copper. We're talking about nickel. We're talking about lithium. All of those are, are vital to uh, U.S. military uh, industry. In fact, there's this um, uh, African, uh, Ali Missouri, he wrote a book, a series called The African, and he made a statement. He said that if Congo was to stop its cobalt from coming out of the country, out of, out of, uh, out of the country, it would immediately ground the, the NATO flotilla. See, they're, they're, they're dependent on co cobalt for, for the military. Today, um, it's expanded where it's the electric vehicles and green energy transition. Uh, that uh, uh, particularly important uh, uh, and need the, need the cobalt. Uh, in fact, the U.S. has passed um, three bills that uh, are related to it, uh, the, the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, all of those have uh, elements in it that deal with securing uh, critical minerals coming out of the Congo, uh, coming out of Central Africa, coming out of Zambia. So it's of uh, strategic interest to the United States. But to get to the, the, the heart of the, your, your initial question as to how it all started, the U.S. backed an invasion in 1996 of its allies, Rwanda and Uganda. They overthrew, ultimately overthrew Mobutu and uh, installed a gentleman by the name of Lauren Desiree Kabila. And Kabila was like a puppet, uh, and he wanted to shake himself loose of Rwanda and Uganda. So he, he, he tried to do that, and, and he was successful in doing that. Uh, and the way he did that was to call in uh, African nations uh, from the Southern African development community. As you know, the continent is aligned in different blocks, you know, East African community, you know, ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states. And so you have Southern African development community and Congo became a part of that. And uh, so Kabila called in uh, the Southern African development community. At the time, Mugabe was there uh, from Zimbabwe, Dos Santos was in power, Mangola. So they all came to the to the rescue of Kabila, and they drove out the, the, the U.S. back, Rwandan and Ugandan troops. Uh, and when they, uh, when they did that, Rwanda and Uganda decided to invade again a second time in 1998. Uh, but uh, they weren't successful because Kabila had the Southern African developed community uh, behind them. Uh, they eventually, uh, you know, became that, 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 that second invasion, 1998, it triggered what uh, the International Rescue Committee said was the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II, where 5.4 million Congolese, they estimate, uh, perished as a result of the war and war-related causes. So from 19, the 1996 first invasion, 1998 second invasion, that triggered uh, what we uh, see in, in the Congo uh, today, and there's tremendous loss of, of life, at least 6 million dead since 1996. Now, there was a peace treaty in 2002 uh, and uh, between, you know, Rwanda, Uganda, the Congo, uh, they all signed a, a peace treaty. But during the time that Rwanda and Uganda occupied Congo, they were able to siphon out, plunder the resources of the Congo. In the case of Uganda, uh, they were able to extract uh, timber and gold in particular 
in the case of uh, Rwanda, they're able to extract uh, tin, uh, wolframite, uh, they're able to extract uh, coltan in particular. So when you look at the books of these countries um, over the years from 1996 right up to today, you see these minerals, uh, the export in these minerals have shot up exponentially to the point where Rwanda has become the number one producer of coltan in the world. Now, when uh, the peace treaty occurred in 2002 and Rwanda and Uganda wanted to maintain interest uh, in the Congo, what they did was they mounted uh, militia, proxy militia groups uh, that they, they supported in uh, the Congo. And right up to this day, 25 years later, Rwanda still supports a proxy, proxy militia groups in the Congo. The latest one is called the M23. Uh, they, they supported them in, 10 years ago when Obama, President Obama was in office. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of pressure put on Obama to do something about it because when he was a senator, he wrote a law uh, he wrote a bill that got uh, turned into law uh, that uh, called on the United States government to withhold aid from any country that destabilizes the Congo. And U.S. ally Rwanda and Uganda were doing that. So a lot of pressure was put on him, and he, he withheld $200,000 in military aid, which is nothing, right? Uh, but what that did was it triggered other countries, uh, uh, European countries, to withhold tens of millions of dollars from uh, from uh, from Rwanda, and that helped to, to squelch the M23. Uh, but they they weren't all uh, how can I say they they they, they weren't all uh, contained in the Congo. Some of them went back to Uganda. Some of them went back to Rwanda. And since 2021, they've been resuscitated. So what we've seen since 1996 is a quarter century war of aggression and plunder, led by U.S. allies. Uh, in uh, Central Africa. And in fact, it's because these countries are US allies, because the United States over the years uh, has run diplomatic and political interference on behalf of these countries so that they wouldn't be held to account, so that justice wouldn't be delivered, and in fact, so that the impunity would, con would continue. It's primarily because of that, that uh, this conflict uh, and the suffering on the part of the Congolese people uh, have been able to, to continue. Even as we speak today, uh, Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, was at the National Breakfast um, in, in Washington, uh, National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. I think he was a keynote. And uh, it was reported that he's looking to enter into some kind of a partnership with a congressional black caucus. So even though he has the blood of millions, millions of Africans on his hands, even though it's been documented time and time again by a whole slew of uh, UN, a group of experts report, uh, the United States uh, still um, supports um, Kagame. And for good reasons, we can get into some of the reasons why they, why they do. But that's really the backdrop to uh, the suffering that we see in the Congo where you have uh, up to 7 million people uh, who have been internally displaced and uh, millions have perished um, since, uh, since 1996. But it has happened in a tremendous amount of silence and relative obscurity uh, for a whole host of um, uh, reasons uh, that has to do with uh, white supremacy, racism, has to do with the devaluing of black life, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, the U.S. Uh, has a role to, to play in it. Um, so the corporate media is not as critical. And uh, mind you, if it was the Chinese or the Russian who were backing Rwanda, it would be all over the news. <laughs> Right? right about the atrocities that they are triggering in the in the heart of the African continent, but they, you, because it's the U.S., it's not as it's not as widely known. And you don't even hear much about this on mainstream media. I mean, you're hearing about Israel and and Gaza a lot because partly because it involves Israel, but also because there have been mass protests all across the world, right? In, in support of the Palestinian people. But one of the things that you mentioned were the resources. And I found this article here from Al Jazeera. You mentioned the cobalt, mining of cobalt, copper in the DRC, leading to human rights abuses. So one of the things that Al Jazeera pointed out is that the expansion of industrial scale mines that extract cobalt and copper for rechargeable batteries has led to forced evictions and human rights abuses, including sexual assault in the DR, according to Amnesty International. So 
some of the resources that you were referring to, Cobalt is one that continues to come up. Uh, a lot of times, this is why it drives me crazy when people say that these countries in Africa are poor. A lot of these okay. countries are rich in resources. And you, you can see this all for yourself. I'm sure you've seen as well. And that's why it, it really, really bothers me. So again, here we have uh, another country that is rich in resources, but other countries in the West, like the U.S., are trying to find ways to extract these resources. Could you explain to people why is cobalt so significant? Why that one? Yeah, uh, cobalt, well, the, the short answer is it's a, it's a central ingredient in rechargeable batteries. Uh, that you, you really can't have the rechargeable batteries without, uh, without the, uh, the cobalt. And uh, Congo uh, produces 70% of the world's cobalt. That is to say, if you were to add up all the countries in the world that produce cobalt, they wouldn't equal what Congo produces. Um, so it's, it's, some people call it the Saudi Arabia of cobalt. And this is particularly important because we're, um, earlier I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act. People say it's the largest climate uh, bill in the history of the United States. Uh, well, we are on the verge of a green energy transition, a clean energy transition. When we saw the United Auto Workers and 350.org and the Sierra Club and all of them unite to talk about demanding that uh, the workers at the, they, they, they said the workers at the top of the ED supply chain, the electric vehicle supply chain, be protected as we move from a, com a combustion engine to electric vehicles. So we, so we saw how uh, the labor, climate, progressive forces rallied uh, around the auto workers so that uh, they uh, would have a soft landing, so to speak, and, and be able to still uh, have a viable income after this uh, transition. Well. There is no top of the electric vehicle supply chain without the bottom of the electric vehicle supply chain. Electric vehicle would not exist without Congo's cobalt. And at the bottom of the supply chain, uh, we say there are three Ds that, that uh, are pervasive at the bottom of the supply chain. chain. Uh, one D is death. The second is destruction. The third is displacement. Death, uh, artisanal miners, those who are mining with their hands, uh, they account for about 20% or so of the cobalt that comes out of the, uh, of the Congo. And they uh, go into tunnels into, that go uh, tens of meters uh, into, into the ground. Uh, they, they're caving. Uh, they, uh, the, all of this, these minerals are radioactive. Um, so uh, the women who are in there and the children who are in the, in the mine, uh, they're affected with uh, tremendous... Uh, uh, devastation to their health. Uh, the women in the Congo uh, have the highest uh, metal. There are children. There are children yes, yes. In the that amnesty in, in report that you, uh, you 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 cited uh, talked about child labor. In fact, there's a suit in the uh, in the U.S. courts right now that's being brought against five tech companies: against uh, Apple, against Microsoft, against uh, Google, against Dell, and against Tesla for purchasing minerals that uh, draw, that use child labor in the Congo. And the suit is being brought by the international right advocates on behalf of 14 Congolese um, children who either died or were injured in their families uh, for these companies who benefit from Congo's minerals. Uh, in fact, uh, there's an interview that, that was Tim Cook, uh, maybe, maybe about a month ago, uh, the, the uh, CEO of Apple, and he was asked directly, you know, do, do you source minerals from the Congo that has child labor on it? And he says categorically no. Uh, but uh, it's, it's false. He cannot say that. Because, uh, uh, New York University Stern's um, School of Business, uh, they did a study uh, in uh, October, uh, February of 2023 where they documented that any minerals coming out of the Congo, cobalt, uh, there's no company that can say that it's not tainted by child labor because what happens is the industrial mined minerals and the artisanal mined minerals, and that's where you have the child labor component, they get mixed together before they even leave the country. And there's absolutely no way of distinguishing what comes from the industrial mine or what comes from the artisanal mine. So Apple, Dell, Microsoft, none of them can say 
that uh, they're sourcing minerals from the Congo that doesn't have child labor in it. If you're sourcing minerals from the Congo, uh, it's highly likely it has child labor. At the very least, you cannot say it doesn't have child labor. So, uh, so the point is though that uh, at the bottom of the supply chain, you know how we you talked about earlier this uh, silence around the tremendous loss of life in the Congo. We're talking about the mm -hmm. deadliest conflict in the world since World War II, and people don't even know about it. Well, the same thing that comes with the these resources, right? Because there is no green energy transition without Congo's resources. It's 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 fundamental to our way of life, right? But yet we're not connected to it. We don't. We're not aware of it. So you even have advocates, progressives, you know, labor unions and climate justice folks. When they advocate, they're silent about the Congo. <laughs> they're advocating at the top of the supply chain, when in fact there is no top without a bottom. And the, the displacement that takes place uh, around the industrial mines, if, in, in the mines that these companies have, they have to displace the local population. We have a delegation in the Congo right now in a place called Kolwezi. And they were hitting us back, hitting, up, hitting us up and saying, hey, we're trying to move from Kolwezi in the north down to Lubumbashi in the south, but the road is blocked off. And the reason why the road is blocked off is because there was a protest on the part of diggers that were... Um, uh, being uh, trying to get access to uh, to uh, an industrial mine, and the the police, uh, the military, and the presidential guards all came out to crush them. Right. So when people are displaced, uh, they are promised housing, they are promised healthcare, they are promised education. Uh, when they're displaced, they set up industrial mines, but they rarely ever get any of that. So this is a displacement. And then I mentioned to you the death of, uh, uh, as well, and death also occurs around the industrial mines because when people resist and rise up because they've been displaced, the security forces come in and, uh, and kill people. And there was a case in the Canadian courts that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, they're trying to hold a Canadian mining company accountable for being complicit in the deaths of Congolese who were displaced as a result of the establishment of industrial mines. And then we talk about the destruction, the environment, uh, the toxic waste that goes into the water system uh, that actually literally kills all the fish in the water, uh, pollutes the water so it's no longer drinkable. Uh, there's dust that comes from the uh, industrial mine that goes, you know, floats in the air and lands on plants, uh, and you're not, and it just destroys the uh, the plants and the and the soil, so you're not able to to farm and produce food. So all this is happening at the bottom of the supply chain. So one of the things that we uh, we're pushing is for these progressives, the, the climate justice folks, the labor folks, the uh, acknowledge, right, that there is no top of the supply chain without a bottom. And there's a tremendous amount of suffering taking place at the bottom of the supply chain. And at the very least, we ought to amplify these voices, tell these stories, so that uh, they can be taken into consideration when we talk about uh, developing policy around a green energy transition. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom in California, he's saying that California is going to be uh, combustion-free by 2035 can't do that without Congo. So, but we don't hear Gavin Newsom, we don't hear the elected officials, we don't hear folks in California talking about it. So that's why we're going into to the students, we're talking to grassroots folks, those who are involved in climate just, justice act, activism, involved in labor, and saying, hey, if you're going to have a carbon-free uh, California in, by 20, 2035, uh, what of the Congolese? What, you know, what of the Congolese uh, where the Royal Bank says 70 million of the 100 million people in the country live on less than $2.15 a day when they're in arguably the richest country on the planet. So uh, each and every one of us uh, who are beneficiaries, uh, whether directly, indirectly, uh, from the resources that come out of the Congo, at the very least, uh, we should be amplifying the Congolese voices, telling the stories about what is happening with the death, what is happening with the displacement, what is happening with the destruction. Uh, and uh, include that Congolese story in there so that we can bring policymakers, world leaders, intellectual, you name it, uh, bring all of those expertise and resources to bear on addressing uh, the disastrous situation that we see at the bottom of the electronic, uh, the EV supply chain, at the bottom of the green energy, uh, green energy transition, which we all depend on and which we all say uh, is uh, indispensable for saving the planet. Now, interestingly enough, with the Congo, that's just one side of, the, of why Congo is so critical to each and every one of us, because the country is also part of the second largest rainforest in the world. 
uh, and it's vital in this battle against the climate crisis. Uh, and in the Congo Basin itself, uh, it sequesters more carbon than all of the tropical rainforests combined. We're talking about the Amazon, Borneo. And in addition to that, they have what in the Congo Basin, what they call the peatlands. The peatlands is a carbon bomb. It's a result of sediment and uh, debris developing over thousands of years, and it traps carbon in the soil. And there's enough carbon trapped in the, in the soil and the peatlands in the Congo to account for about 20 years of uh, pollution coming from the U.S. as a result of uses of combustion engines. The peatlands in the Congo is the size of England. So that has to be protected. So Congo, uh, on the one hand, is in, indispensable in the fight against the climate emergency. And on the other hand, uh, it is uh, critical, vital, uh, if we're going to have a green energy, clean energy transition because of the, right. the cobalt that comes out of the Congo. This is why I continue to tell people there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. Because somebody, someone is always being exploited somewhere. So people yeah. watching may think, well, I don't hear about these things happening in the United States, but someone somewhere in the world is being exploited, whether it's the Congo, whether it's South America, like we've talked about this before, how there's a lot of exploitation in the global South. And then, and then on top of that, when we talk about the, the cobalt and the rechargeable batteries, I mean, think about some of the things that you guys use. Like if you have a cell phone, like you drive a car that has an engine, like it's just, we're all- You fly an airplane, you, you name it. You name yeah. it. Yeah. There, there is a, there, 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 um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a macabre interview, but uh, uh, Bloomberg inter interviewed uh, the CEO. Uh, his name is Freeland of, of Ivanhoe. Uh, it's a mining company in the, in the Congo. And they were talking about uh, the price of copper and all. In fact, uh, cobalt, you don't have cobalt without copper. Cobalt is, a, is, a, is not mined by itself. It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of mining copper and nickel. And Congo is just flush with, uh, with, uh, with, with copper. And uh, uh, the, the CEO, um, Freeland, he was saying that uh, Congo sits the number three in the world now behind Chile in terms of production of copper. And uh, it will eventually become, become number one because of the quality of copper and all that's in the Congo. And uh, the, the interview was asking him, you know, we hear these stories about, uh, you know, the price of copper going down and uh, primarily because uh, uh, China is not demanding as much copper as it used to. And he, and he responded, he's like, don't forget about China. He's like, there, there's, uh, there's Italy, there's India, uh, all these countries that, um, uh, that, that need copper. And then he went on to say, in addition to that, we have these conflicts going around the world, going on in the world. If somebody shoots at you, you need to shoot back. And in order to shoot back, you need copper. You need copper for your, for your bullet. So with the wars that are taking place, uh, with a military that's, uh, that needs uh, more copper, the price is going to go up. And so uh, that was, you know, that's from a CEO, you know, frame of mind that, you know, like wars are good for the price of copper, right? So we're not concerned about the price of copper going down. But he, he just happens to be a part of uh, a project that uh, pits the, the United States uh, against China. You know, China's got the, um, the Belt and Road Initiative and the mm -hmm. U.S. has launched an uh, infrastructure uh, initiative around the world. And Congo is one of the testing grounds for it, where they have, uh, the United States has invested in uh, transporting copper from the, the heart of the copper belt in the interior of the Congo uh, right out to, to the Atlantic Ocean through Congo and Angola. It's called the Lubito, uh, Lubito um, Corridor. And uh, Ivanhoe Mines is a, is a part of that effort. That just in December of 2023, they, ship, they made the first um, shipment out. And that, what that does is that it provides uh, the United States access to what it calls uh, critical minerals. And uh, they're able to get it out uh, cheaper, uh, less expensive, and in less time, because before you'd either have to go down to, to South Africa, uh, through the Cape of Good Hope and get it out there, or go through uh, Tanzania and get it out there. But this direct line, uh, which is part of an uh, infrastructure um, initiative uh, by the United States and the European Union to secure access to the critical minerals to power this uh, green energy transition, uh, the Ivanhoe, uh, Ivanhoe Mines is, is one of the companies that uh, uh, that is uh, is a part of this whole initiative. So there's there's really um, there's a corporate interest, uh, there's geostrategic interest, 
uh, there's a range of interests that are arrayed uh, against the Congolese people, unfortunately. Wow, 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 wow. Well, Maurice, uh, who do you feel people should follow? Because like I said, mainstream media really isn't touching this. We're talking about millions of people that have been killed uh, in the Congo. Like I said, there's a lot of coverage about Israel and Gaza because I feel it because it involves Israel and the U.S. has a vested interest there. But in reference to, um, I would say, news outlets or uh, journalists and, uh, besides yourself that are following this, who do you feel that people should follow to stay up to date in reference to what's happening in the Congo? Uh, definitely follow us and all of the social, uh, on at least three social media, I should say, at least three social media, uh, at Congo Friends on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, that's at Congo Friends, because uh, what we do is we aggregate news from uh, different, uh, different sources. And we also uh, connected with a network of journalists uh, in the Congo who are reporting uh, about what's on, happening in different parts of the country. And part of the silence, too, uh, I have to say, even though it's not a necessarily a major part, the Congo is French speaking. So there's a language barrier. Uh, so we've assembled uh, English speaking journalists to get English uh, news out. The uh, Breakthrough News uh, does a, a good job of uh, covering the, the Congo. Uh, and certainly, uh, Black Agenda Report, that's the primary. Uh, destination, uh, the Black Agenda Report, Black Agenda Radio. Um, we write for them, and a number of other people write around the around the Congo about them, uh, about what's happening in the in the Congo. So those are those are some sources, uh, English sources that I, I would recommend. Uh, Friends of the Congo, our website, friendsofthecongo.org, uh, Black Agenda Report, uh, Breakthrough News. Uh, they all um, provide good reporting uh, coming out of the Congo. People's Dispatch is a, is another one that uh, provide uh, good reporting coming out of the Congo. Awesome. All right, Maurice, thank you so much for coming on. We'll be following. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right, guys, lots of information there. I actually do have a couple of other guests that are going to be coming on around about nine. Uh, so I do want to go ahead and cover, I think I'm going to cover the Nikki Haley story and then we'll pivot back and thank patrons towards the end because I want to make sure I have enough time to accommodate them as well. But welcome, guys. Welcome. Maurice, very knowledgeable about this subject. Again, I interviewed Margaret Kimberly a while back about the Congo and she highly recommended Maurice uh, as well. I want to go ahead to some of the comments here. Thank you. Uh, Negro 489 says as a Congolese man, I appreciate it. Sabs, you are welcome. JB says, hello, everyone. Solidarity with the people of the Congo forehead kisses. Eric, uh, I'll come back to that one. Suzanne says, yes, Sabi, we can't have any productive societies besides the besides us unless they are a U.S. puppet state, well-behaved and serving our agendas. Interesting point there, Suzanne. And thank you for the super chat, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne. Knowledgeable guests providing important context. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, uh, NY Varsity. So Israeli is doing a genocide, and instead of providing aid, none being allowed, we give aid to Israel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Being sarcastic there. And thank you, Eric. African intercommunalism equals pan-Africanism 2.0. Adona says, thank you for covering this, Sabi. It's all connected to the imperialistic savagery we are witnessing. Yes, I agree. Thank you, Lorez. Demand for these mineral, excuse me, demand for these metals is so high because of our tech and wasteful culture. There's no reason to get a new phone every one or two years. I'm using a phone from 2018, still good. That's a good point, Lorez. Thank you, Dina. Thanks for keeping us informed. And thank you for this uh, New York as well. Can't we exploit people and pay them? We give billions to Nazis in Ukraine. Can't we, can't pay them for what we use every day? I don't think anyone should be exploited. Uh, and Soccer Papa says, Savvy, please try to get Emer Za on. I will check that out as well. All right, guys, what else are we discussing tonight? Let's go ahead and share the thumbnail here, and we're going to dive into this Nikki Haley story. Tonight, we are discussing Kamala Harris Muslim ban. Yes, it's crazy out here in these streets, folks. 
<laughs> I kid you not. It is crazy out here in the streets. We're going to get into that story. We're also going to discuss, if you not, have not heard, this is probably going to be one of the most uh, craziest stories of the night. Maura Healy and Ayanna Presley, the migrant issue in Boston, we're actually going to have a couple of residents that uh, live in that area where this happened. They're going to be coming on to the show around 9 p.m. to discuss what's happening with people being displaced here. Like, it, look, there's displacement happening all over, all over. It's just, it's crazy. And of course, we're also going to discuss Nikki Haley pushes back. And Maurice was just here to discuss the crisis in the Congo. So it's crazy stuff, guys. I tell you, when I say people are being displaced all over, it's happening all over. So we're going to get into this story about Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley recently had an interview with Meet the Press. They've been having some cringe interviews lately where she feels that Trump has always been his worst enemy, and she's going to explain to you why she has decided to stay in the race. What's really interesting, I looked at the poll numbers and I told you that Nikki Haley is not polling well in South Carolina at all, but she is vowing to stay in the race. It kind of gives me Elizabeth Warren vibes from 2020 when Elizabeth Warren decided to stay in the race uh, Super Tuesday. Now Nikki Haley is saying that same thing. I kid you not. Let's go ahead and get into it. And joining me now is Ambassador Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks so much, Kristen, for having me. Well, we really appreciate your being here. As you know, former President Donald Trump has called on you to get out of this race. The RNC says it's time for Republicans to unify around Mr. Trump. What is your response to this apparent pressure campaign against you? Look, I mean, he can't bully his way through the nomination. I think that, you know, it's not surprising that he is surrounded by the political elite. But let's keep in mind, the political elite has gotten nothing done for us in stopping the wasteful spending, has gotten nothing done to secure the border, has gotten nothing done to keep us more safe as we see wars around the world. And so, look, that's exactly what we don't want. I mean, the reason the political elite are upset and the members of Congress are upset is because I've pushed for term limits. I've pushed for a mental competency test. I've said if they don't get a budget out on time, they shouldn't get paid. So, look, I have fought this political class um, my entire life, and it's it's I'd much rather be fighting for the people than fighting for the elected officials in D.C. Ambassador. So I'm sorry. So this is Nikki Haley being disingenuous. She's not fighting for the people. She's not fighting for the people. You know, is everyone saying that now? Everyone's just like, I'm out there. I'm the only one out there fighting for the people. Nikki Haley is corporate. Nikki Haley is bought. Nikki Haley belongs to the military industrial complex. She's not fighting for the people. Let's continue. Sir, do you think just going back to the RNC, calling for the party to unify around Trump, which happened, by the way, during the New Hampshire primary before the polls had even closed, do you think the RNC has been an honest broker in this case? I mean, clearly not. If you're going to go and, and basically tell... Uh, the American people that you're going to go and decide who the nominee is after only two states have voted. I mean, 48 states out there. This is a democracy. The American people want to have their say in who is going to be their nominee. We need to give them that. I mean, you can't do that based on just two states. And not only that, it's 1,215 delegates to reach the nomination. Donald Trump has 32. I have 17. So let's let this play out. Let's do what we need to. I mean, we saw South Carolinians. We had 15 hundred people last night in Greenville County. And I think that Americans want to be able to make this decision themselves. I don't think this is the place of the RNC to do it. I think that uh, Trump overstepped when he pushed them to do it. And I think that's why he's had to back down. And that was. Let's pause here for a second. Ah, so you see another similarity of the RNC and the DNC now, right? Nikki Haley is complaining that the RNC is just basically saying like, no, Trump's going to be the nominee. And Nikki Haley is saying, we need to let this play out. We live in a democracy. I told you guys before, we don't have a true democracy. If we did, something like this wouldn't even be an issue. But also, this is no different from what the DNC is doing, right? The DNC announced last year that Joe Biden will be the nominee. They're not really entertaining any of his challengers. They're not going to receive any delegates. So this is another example to show you how both parties are similar. 
they both have their picks. Nikki Haley was chosen by the donor class. Don't get me wrong. There are some Democrats that want Nikki Haley. And then you have Trump, who basically Trump's MAGA base is very strong. As much as mainstream media pundits will tell you that the Trump base died, obviously we see that is not true. That's not the case. But this is another example where you see the similarities between the parties, both corporate, both belonging to the military industrial complex, and both deciding who the candidate, the nominee will actually be. It's the right thing to do was to back down. And, and just do, do you have actual knowledge and awareness that he pushed the RNC to do that and then pulled back? I mean, we know exactly the people that pushed it are his people. And I know that during the debates, I mean, he was pushing Ronna McDaniel to stop the debates. He was calling her every other day. He's been pushing them um, to pay for his lawsuits and all of these other things. But at the end of the day, this is not about the RNC. This is about the American people. This is not another similarity here. She said that Trump, it was him and his people that pushed for this with the RNC. No, don't want to have the debates. Let's just continue on. I'm going to be the nominee. And if we look at the Democratic Party, Biden and his people push the DNC to say, nope, nope, I'm the nominee. That's it. We're not going to do any debates. The Republican Party was at least the GOP was at least willing to have debates. Right. But it's a little bit different because Trump is not actually the incumbent. He's not sitting in the White House at this point in time. But just another similarity not about a, you know, a political party deciding who they want to be the nominee. You know, when I ran for governor, there were five uh, candidates. I was far from the nominee. I was the one, I, you know, I ran against a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, a congressman and a state senator. They did the same thing to me then. I won then. I'm going to win now. Let's talk about your path forward. As you know, Trump has a double digit lead in the polls. He secured the endorsement of a lot of the top officials in your state. Before we get to that, let me talk about something that Nikki Haley just said. Yeah, uh, when she ran for governor in South Carolina, she was not the fave, uh, but she was able to win. The difference is uh, there's quite a bit of people in South Carolina that are not too happy with Nikki Haley after her governorship. This is the part that she's not telling uh, meet the press here. For example, one of the criticisms that came towards Nikki Haley, she flipped flopped when it came to the Confederate flag. At one moment during her governorship, she said that it's about heritage. It means one thing to one people. It means something different to other. But at the end of the day, it's about, you know, heritage and those who had some type of heritage in reference to the Civil War. Right. But after the shooting from Dylan Roof, Nikki Haley changed her position on the Confederate flag and said the flag needs to come down. And it was not a surprise some of Nikki Haley's supporters turned on her when she made that position. I have family in South Carolina. I'm here to tell you guys, when I tell you that a lot of people in South Carolina like Donald Trump, trust me, a lot of people in South Carolina like Donald Trump, more so than they like Nikki Haley and she was the state's governor. You can just look at the polls and see the difference. He's beating her by double digits. She's being, he's being, well, she's being actually, she is being blown out by Donald Trump in South Carolina right now. It's not even close. And it's it's not even funny. But she says she's going to stay in the race through Super Tuesday. Do you need to win South Carolina, your home state, in order to win the nomination? Well, let's first talk about the people that he surrounded himself in South Carolina. Um, yes, he got the, the endorsement of the governor, but that's the same governor that I defeated when I ran for governor. Yes, he got the endorsement of the political class in South Carolina, but that's the same group that I forced to have to show their votes on the record. It's the same group that I forced to pass ethics re reform where they had to disclose their income. It's the same group where I vetoed half a billion dollars of pet projects that I didn't think taxpayer dollars should go to. So there's no surprise there that the political leader surrounding him there, he has become, Trump has become an insider. That's what it comes down to is he's more interested in satisfying the elected class than he is in satisfying the people. When it 
So are you, Nikki. This is the funny part is that she talks as though she's not an insider. She is an insider. She's a politician. She actually had like military contractors. Like she was working for military contractors. Nikki Haley is an insider. So what's funny to me that she's talking about this. She's speaking about Donald Trump as though as though he's he's the elite one. He's the insider. He's the one that's cozy with the politicians, but she's the same way. She's not different. Mm, mm, mm. Comes to South Carolina. Look, we wanted to be strong. And I think you look, we started with 2% in Iowa. We ended up with 20%. We got to New Hampshire. We needed to do better than that. And we did. We got 43% of the vote. Now we're going into South Carolina. We need to be stronger than what we did in New Hampshire. And so that's certainly what we need to do. But it's not just that we need to be stronger, Kristen. Trump needs to be stronger. He's not getting the independent vote. He's not getting a segment of the Republicans. And so he's got some work to do as well. He's blowing you out the water. This is funny, you guys. I'm not kidding you. If you look at the polls, he is blowing you out of the water in South Carolina right now. And she says that he needs to do better. (laughs) Okay. Let me just make sure we get an answer, though, Ambassador Haley, because this is your home state. You were governor in the state of South Carolina. Do you need to win your home state in order to stay in this race? Is it do or die? I think I need to do better than I did in New Hampshire. So this is a building situation. But it's not need about to which win, state you get in which state. You don't, do you need to actually win? I, think I, I need you to, saying you're, you need to do better. But do, don't you need to win your home state to show that you can win a state, win your home state, and really put some delegates on the map for yourself? Well, we've got 17 delegates. He's got 32. I'd say that's pretty good to start. What I do think I need to Okay, so Nikki Haley doesn't want to answer that question, so I'll answer it for her. Yes. Nikki Haley needs to win South Carolina in order to have a strong showing that she has a chance of actually being the nominee. She doesn't want to say that. She's already BSing you. Just pay attention. She's already a politician. She's already BSing you. The reality is, is this. There's something about South Carolina that is a game changer in reference to the primary process, whether it's the Republican Party or whether it's the Democratic Party. Remember, it was South Carolina that changed the race for Joe Biden. He was not at the top of the list. Bernie Sanders had won uh, New Hampshire. He won Nevada. Some argue that he won Iowa. Pete Buttigieg actually announced early. That was on purpose, by the way. We knew Pete wasn't going to do well in South Carolina. I told you I'd live there. Right? South Carolina changed the race for Joe Biden and people can kind of, you know, understand, oh, maybe, oh, I didn't do that well in New Hampshire or I did okay in Iowa, et cetera. But if by the time you get to South Carolina, again, it has the oldest electorate and it is a red state. So it's a little bit different from the Democrat primary process in reference to South Carolina, because the Democrats are not going to win South Carolina in the general. The Republican party will win South Carolina in the general. So Nikki Haley, hun, if you cannot win South Carolina in the primary, yes, it is over for you. And I think it's a waste of time for you to stay in until super Tuesday. I'm just keeping it real with you guys to do is I need to show that I'm building momentum. I need to show that I'm stronger in South Carolina than New Hampshire. Does that have to be a win? I don't think that necessarily has to be a win, but it certainly has to be better than what I did in New Hampshire, and it certainly has to be close. And so that's what we're focusing on. If we win, great. If not, we've got to show that we're continuing to narrow that margin along the way. So I hear you. To give people in Super Tuesday states a reason to know that they can continue to see and and have us fight on. So I hear you say. Pause. So she thinks even if she loses in South Carolina, that if she gets the Super Tuesday, if she has a strong showing in South Carolina, but let's say she still loses, which I think she will, if she can get to Super Tuesday, that's going to motivate people to say, yeah, let me go out there and vote for Nikki Haley. That didn't happen for other people that were in the Democrat primary process in 2020. Let's remember this again. South Carolina is a game changer. You had Bernie Sanders, who was actually leading the primary. Then came South Carolina. Jim Clyburn said, everybody just go vote for Joe because we know Joe and Joe knows us. 
all the older black folk in South Carolina came out and supported Joe Biden. Bernie ended up in second place. Bernie went on through Super Tuesday. And a lot of us, I think, thought that's OK. Bernie's going to get some of these states for Super Tuesday. Didn't happen the way that we thought it would. Even Kyle Kalinske said, had to come back on Secular Talk and say that he was wrong. His prediction was wrong, right? No, because after Joe Biden won South Carolina, he went on to win a number of states for Super Tuesday, including my state of Massachusetts. So the reality is, if she does not win South Carolina, I don't see that motivating people in the other states to say, we got to get out there and show out there for, no. And then what happened? Joe Biden went on and won the nomination for the Democratic Party. If Nikki Haley loses South Carolina. Donald Trump is going to go on and win the nomination for the Republican Party. This is just the reality of the situation. Nikki knows this. You are in this regardless of the results in South Carolina through Super Tuesday. It sounds like here's how the Wall Street Journal editorial board is thinking about your campaign. They write, if she can remain competitive, there's an argument for Ms. Haley to stay in the race through the July convention. Mr. Trump faces a treacherous legal road, and one of the cases against him could go to trial if he's convicted of a felony. 42% of voters in New Hampshire and nearly a third of Iowa's GOP caucus goers said Mr. Trump would be unfit for the presidency. Are you staying in this race in case Donald Trump is convicted of a crime ambassador? I've never stayed in this race because of court cases. Um, you know, really, I don't know what all the court cases are. I haven't paid attention to what he's won, what he's lost, what he's fighting for, any of that. What I know is, you know, the first one came down and he spent a lot of time ranting about how he lost that court case. But the reality is every time he's talking about defending himself in court, he's not talking about getting our economy back on track. He's not talking about closing the border. He's not talking about how we're going to get our kids reading again and getting us focused focus again. He's not talking about. Sorry. Maybe I have just been in a tunnel somewhere, but almost every speech we've heard Donald Trump make, hasn't he brought up the economy? Hasn't he brought up getting the economy back on track? And I'm not a Trump supporter, but I'm just debunking Nikki here. Hasn't he brought up the war, the war issue, how these things wouldn't have happened if he would have still been in off. Am I alone here? Am I alone? Okay. Law and order. That's the problem is he's not talking about what the American people want. Kristen, look at what happened just in the 48 hours after the election. Here he went on a, he was totally unhinged, went on a rampage election night talking about revenge. Then the next day he goes and says, anybody who supports me is not going to be allowed to be part of MAGA. Well, that means those people that voted for me in Iowa and New Hampshire and those people who donated to me, really, you're going to go and say they're not in your club? You're supposed to be president representing everyone. Yeah. Then he goes and pushes the Republican Party to make him the nominee. I mean, look, he's insecure. He's threatened. He sees what's happening and he knows these court cases are going to take him further and further and, away from the campaign trail. And that's what he's worried about. And you bring up the court cases. I want to get to them. But just yes or no. Are you in this race through the convention beyond Super Tuesday? Yes or no? As long as I keep growing per state, I am in this race. I have through every intention of going to Super Tuesday. Through the, through Super T Tuesday, we're going to keep on going and see where this gets us. That's what we know we're going to do right now. I take it one state at a time. I don't think too far ahead. Let's. When she says we're going to see where this gets us, she's talking about uh, she she's talking about other opportunities. Let's keep it real. She's talking about other opportunities. Oh, let me see if I can get some kind of cabinet position. Another military contract. Maybe, maybe. Or maybe she may be courted by no labels. Don't be fooled. No labels has a lot of money, a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars. Maybe that's the plan. I wouldn't be surprised, like, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the Democratic Party didn't try to find a way to work with Nikki. Because look at these polls, son. Look at the poll. CNN's inaugural road to 270 shows Trump in a position to win the White House. Don't get mad at me. This is what the map shows. 
the yellow states here are toss up. So Arizona, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, they are saying that those states in particular are a toss up. Light blue means leaning Democrat. I mean, I don't know why Oregon is light blue. Oregon's always Democrat. <laughs> I don't know about that one. Um, but Colorado, New Mexico, Minnesota, and Virginia, and of course, New Hampshire up here is light blue. So that means they're leaning uh, towards uh, Joe Biden. And dark blue, of course, is like the definites. And those are the usual suspects, right? And then you have the light red states, which are leaning more in Trump's direction. Notice Michigan is one of those states now. And this is what I tried to forewarn people about, is that Joe Biden is losing in Michigan and he needs Michigan in order to win. But that is leaning more towards Donald Trump right now. North Carolina doesn't surprise me. Neither does Florida. I keep saying I, I'm tired of people calling Florida a swing state. I think Florida is a red state. I've been saying that for quite some time. Georgia does not surprise me either. I also said I don't think Georgia is a swing state. I think 2020 was a one-off. I think Georgia will go back to being red. But we want to focus on Arizona. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Those will be interesting to see, but what they are saying right now, let me make sure I pull up. Oh, did I go to the, they showed up here. Oh, maybe it's the next one. Oh no, this is it. Yeah. Road to 270. So anyway, as you can see, and this is another thing I've been trying to tell people, if you look at the map, the United States is actually a conservative country. And I've said this, you know, time and time again, the U.S. is a conservative country. Uh, I'm not sure why people think it's not. Now, this is the Electoral College, though, and we do not go by the popular vote in this country. And if we went by the popular vote, then you would see that I think if you look at these areas where there's a lot more people concentrated, like obviously California, Los Angeles, uh, yeah, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts over here, of course, New York City, uh, things would look very differently, Chicago, that kind of thing. But this is where we're at right now. And this is what they're saying, uh, where we're headed towards. And it says right here, the first look at a potential Biden versus Trump rematch and the electoral match, excuse me, electoral math, each would need to capture 270 electoral votes, captures the dynamics at play 10 months before election day. Biden is an incumbent president with stubbornly low approval ratings, persistent questions and concerns about his ability to serve another term and diminished support from some key components of his winning coalition from 2020. Trump is a seriously flawed candidate who has promised to govern in undemocratic ways and who has already been rejected once by the American people after serving one term as president. He faces four criminal indictments consisting of 91 charges related to his attempts to overturn election, his mishandling of classified documents after leaving office and allegedly obstructing law enforcement's attempts to retrieve them, and his falsifying of business records to conceal a hush payment to keep an adult film star from going public with claims of extramarital affair, which he denies in the weeks leading up to the 2016 election. He pled not guilty to all charges against him and maintained no wrongdoing. Now, notice they mentioned all that about Donald Trump, but you notice when they actually describe Joe Biden, they don't mention the allegations that are against Joe Biden. Tara Reid still has allegations against Joe Biden. So let's just be clear about that. But this is what we're looking at now, guys. So it will be interesting to see what happens. Neither of them are my candidate. You guys know I'll be running third party or independent. That's what I'm rolling with. And I'm not going to let other people try to sit up here and fear monger me either, as they always tend to do. But it is what it is. We're going to go to some of the comments here. Let me go ahead, start these. I'll come back to that one. Thank you for the super chat, uh, New York Varsity. Let's put two plus two together here. Research where people's campaign money goes when someone drops out. It is kept for a future run, given to a candidate in the race, or in a rare case, refunded. Hashtag heist. 
Thank you for the super chat, Sean. Sab, get Richard Wolf on to discuss Hungary as they oppose EU funding for Ukraine and EU, threatening to trash their economy in revenge. I can try to do that. It is very hard to get uh, Professor Wolf because he's very, very busy. Sebastian says, when will Tara get justice? Exactly. Exactly. All right. We are going to, I'm right on time. We are going to start the next story and then the guests will pop in. Uh, thank you for that, Eric. Nikki Haley has no true supporters. Thank you uh, for that. Um, Nancy insider trading. That's funny. That's funny. Okay. So we're going to get into this story that is happening in Boston. I have a couple of guests that are coming on, but I want to go ahead and start the story first because I have a, a lot of uh, clips to show. You guys know we've been talking about the migrant crisis that's happening. We've been talking about what's going on at the border. And there have been a number of cities where Governor Abbott has actually sent migrants to. It's not just Chicago. It's not just New York. It's also Boston, right? Uh, they were sent to Martha's Vineyard last year. The rich people in Martha's Vineyard got upset and said, get them out of here. <laughs> Go figure. And they sent those migrants to Cape Cod. And now people in the Cape are like, what the hell? You know? So they have been sent to various cities and towns in Massachusetts. It's not just Boston. Last year, a couple of months ago, Governor Healy actually announced that we are at capacity. All of our emergency shelters are full. So they have actually gotten to the point where they have nowhere else to put the migrants that are being sent here by Governor Abbott. So this is the new news. And you're going to hear from residents, they're going to come on and they're going to talk about how they feel about this. It has gotten to the point now where apparently at Logan Airport in Boston, they have actually been sheltering migrants there. We're going to get started with this clip. And then I'm going to tell you about how they are actually moving migrants into one of the recreation centers in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. And they are keeping the Roxbury residents out of the rec center. People are angry. People are mad. Let's go ahead and get into this clip here. Migrant shelter inside Boston Logan's International Airport. Listen to this. Tonight, dozens of migrants are sheltering inside Boston's Logan Airport. Families, many with young kids, sleeping on blankets, pillows, and benches in the airport's Terminal E as Massachusetts becomes the latest pain point in the nation's ongoing migrant crisis, struggling to find shelter for their growing migrant population. Now, more than 3,500 families. Now, I'm proud of the way Massachusetts stepped up with compassion and solutions for the influx of migrants that's testing states all around this country. Do you think that there's enough support in place to help newly arrived families kind of navigate the system as it exists? There is a shortage in immigration legal services and a, a shortage in, in people who are able to help, but, and, you know, more funding is needed. With eight sanctuary cities across Massachusetts, it's put a strain on statewide resources. Governor Maura Healey calling and on the federal government to step up. While Massachusetts did not create this problem, we're going to continue to demand that Congress take action to fix the border, to get us Funding. Alongside nine Democratic governors, she signed a letter to Congress demanding, quote, Washington to work together to solve what has become a humanitarian crisis. Adding, states and cities cannot indefinitely respond to the subsequent strain on state and local resources without congressional action. Chicago's O'Hare Airport facing a similar scene. Over 200 migrants still sleeping there as they await their housing placements. In Massachusetts, the existing shelter systems can house a maximum of 7,500 families, a limit they reached in November. There is so I just wanted to make sure everyone heard that. We've already reached that 7,500 family limit. So just FYI. 
persons that we have, we no longer have them, so it's been very close to impossible for us to continue to house them. According to the governor's office, 600 families are on the wait list for shelter. Instead, staying at the airport, local churches, or overflow temporary shelters. Massachusetts launched a clinic in the fall to help thousands of migrants staying in the Commonwealth apply for work authorization in the United States. You know, if people are working, we're going to have people exiting from shelter that much quicker. The latest effort to ease the stress on what's become a persistent issue. Okay, more Barrett joins us now live in studio. I okay, and I think uh, one of our guests is already here because it's not just about the situation that's happening at the airport. And what was really interesting about that, apparently during the day, they've actually been moving the migrants out of the airport so that travelers don't see them. But then at night, they're allowing them to come in and sleep there. I don't know where they're sending them during the day. Uh, but I do know that there is a big issue happening right now where they have moved migrants into a rec center in Roxbury in Boston. For those who are not aware, Roxbury is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Boston. It is predominantly African-American neighborhood. And so now because they have moved the migrants into that recreation center, that means that the residents in Roxbury actually cannot go into that rec center. So there's a lot of things that are happening here. People are not happy. I'm going to go ahead and bring on uh, Sean. I see you in the background. Hey, how are you? You just got to unmute. Sorry about that. Hey, how are you? Good yourself. Thanks for having me. Huh? Thank you so much for coming on. So, Sean, I want to play this clip here from, from Maura Healy. Because this is the one that's been circulating around on uh, the web where she's actually crying here. I want to go ahead and bring this in and then I want to come back uh, to you. So this is the clip that pretty much has gone viral on the Internet. This is what I saw the other day. They need to be able to breathe clean air. They need to be able to access swimming pools. They need to have lifeguards there who are going to teach them how to swim. And they need to have activities. I don't know what we're going to do for a couple, three months. I'll call universities. I'll call other places. Need to be able to breathe clean air. So this is Governor Healy. Just basically, she she says she doesn't even know what to do. And I, I want to hear from you, Sean. Where is Mayor Wu? Where is the mayor? Where, where is everybody? Um, they're in the <clears throat> excuse me. They're in the offices um, plotting along with Maura Healy. Don't be don't be fooled. Um, they're all play acting for the cameras. Michelle Wu describes this. She's even on an interview with um, WEBH talking about everyone is welcome to come here for help. She's no different from any progressive. Like back when people were protesting, oh, everyone's human, no one's illegal. She's on the same board. She's even admitted that she's in contact with the Biden administration on a weekly basis. So don't be fooled by the crocodile tears. This is just play acting for us to for sympathy because, oh, boo hoo, I don't know what to do. You've been in office for how long, how many years? No one's, no one's buying this anymore. This is some emotional manipulation. Let me bring in Tia. Tia, I see yeah. you. Welcome. Hi, sorry. sorry I think you that. some oh, have an echo. <clears throat> yeah, let me see if I can see. Okay. Yeah, I think it I think it might have been Tia. Um, here's another video, too, that I want to show because I want to get into what happened in Roxbury. So I actually got this video from Catherine. And this this is another <coughs> one. So this is the recreation center. And I want to show you these are residents here and there are police and the residents are not allowed to come in. Everyone watch this. Go on the sidewalk, gang. Go on the sidewalk. Go on the sidewalk. We can yell from the sidewalk. We can yell from the sidewalk. We can yell from the sidewalk, everybody. Go to the sidewalk. Come to the sidewalk. Come to the sidewalk. <clears throat> I 
So, Sean, the police are escorting them away. Well, let's be clear. They're not escorting us away. They are forcibly pushing us away unlawfully because we've been um, on our megaphones near the door to where they were having their press conference. And what you've seen in the past when politicians like Michelle Wu and Maura Healy are being protested, they don't like it. It's bad for their image because we were so close with our megaphones, you can hear her speech and kind of hear us in the background when people were opening up the doors to come in and out. They couldn't have that. So they ordered um, the police to push us back. You can hear me as what lawful order are you giving me to have me being removed from public property when I've been standing here with Catherine and other people for over 20 minutes on the megaphones? Oh, because somebody inside who are from the administration doesn't like the peasants outside yelling at the elites. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I'm just gonna mute you for just a second, Sean. Mm -hmm. So here's my problem. Some of the things that are happening here, you, you guys can see the police are here. Some of the things that are happening, and I, I wanna be very clear so that people understand the foreign policy issue. OK, so I always tell people to ask yourself, why are they coming here? They're coming here because of bad foreign policy decisions that have been made by our country. We have devastated these countries. We've stolen resources from these countries. These countries are done. That's why so many people are coming here at once. That being said, so I want people to understand, I don't blame the migrants. That being said, here's what I take issue with. I have a problem with the fact that I'm seeing a statement from the governor and they're listing off all the things that they're going to do for those families when they don't even do those things for black people who live in Roxbury in the first damn place. That's what I got a problem with. If I see a list of things where they're saying that I'm seeing them send pictures, there's pictures where they're bringing in strollers for, for the kids and the families. Strollers are not cheap. Where were those strollers for single moms in Roxbury when they needed that help? Where was the clothing and the food for these families in Roxbury when they needed that help? And I know they're not doing it because it's mutual aid organizations like the one that I'm a part of that actually go in and help people in those communities and donate those things. So now all of a sudden the state has all this money when it comes to other groups, but when it comes to black people in those neighborhoods, they said they didn't have the money. I'm going to pass it to you, Sean, then Tia. You're exactly right. They, when these migrants came in, these illegals came in, they seemed to have all this money to take care of them. Free health care, housing, clothing, food, SNAP, everything that we taxpayers, we bust our behinds to go to work for, we can't even get. I was saying like, if I was a penny over a program's, you know, being poverty, oh, you, you, can't, you can't be accepted to this program. You make too much, but yet you have someone come across the, the border they're first in line. You get bumped off in the back. That's it's completely insanity. And I always say that the only reason why they're catering to them is because they're here to replace us as the new voter, the new workers. That's why they're catering to them. That wow. is just really all it is. And as soon as they, because right now, Boston City Council is plotting to give non-citizens the right to vote in local elections. So that means is our voices as Black people are going to be diminished. They're going to be going to them from now on for the, the vote. They're going to be making these promises to them because guess what? You're not going to be promised citizenship. They're going to be dangling it over their heads. Oh, if the Republicans get in the power, you're going to be de you're going to be deported. So they have something now over their heads. If I say, oh, you have to vote for us Democrats because we're going to protect you. We're going to protect you. We're going to give you your needs. The same kind of pandering stuff that they do every election year for us Black folks, education, job care, and all this stuff they, they never deliver on. Then they're going to be promising that to them. Plus, on top of that, we're going to keep you in the country. We're going to keep giving you all this free stuff because we can't let the other side win. Because if not, they're going to kick you out. We're now, we're now becoming second-class citizens. Tia, I want to bring you in here to you because um, if, it's, if it's not for gentrification, which has pushed a lot of people out of these communities, now it's this issue. I want to go ahead. You'll have to unmute Tia and get your take on this because they can't even go into the recreation center. I think you have to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do apologize because dad's listening on his phone from the other side. But um, 
but yeah, it's basically like it's kind of similar to what was happening kind of like with um with kind of like our community center. It's basically kind of like they in, they are intending on basically, you know. <laughs> okay, let me slow down. Um basically, you know, it's kind of not um it's not an accident that they basically chose to um to basically, you know, to um, take over kind of like the Molina, the Molina Cass um, recreational complex to use for their, um, to use for, um, to use for, I am so sorry. I had myself all hyped up and now I'm nervous. Um, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, the migrants, thank you. The migrants, thank you. Okay for this um for this um for the shelter for the migrants and everything because you know they kind of kind of as um Sean was saying that they do have in they do have intentions of basically replacing the people in the area for basically you know just bringing it bringing in kind of like you know people that they can use that for lack of better words that they can use since you know they're yeah Hey dad, um could could you um get that a little quieter? I can hear myself talk. No, seriously, I can hear you. I am so sorry. Um, okay. Well let me um I wanna I wanna play this really quick because this gentleman here, he brings up a really good point. He's outside of the rec center and he wants to know why he's asking the police why he can't come in to his own community rec center. Listen to this. Live fucking here. And I've been here my whole fuck yeah, cause I can yell. Cause I can yell. Cause I can yell. And I'm fucking angry. That's why. I hear you. So why can't I get in the fucking building? Why? Where's the mirror at? Y'all, these fucking towns are fucking shame, yo. It's all about fucking money. It's a fucking money grab. Y'all give a fuck about the motherfuckers that was born and fucking raised here. Y'all raised the fucking rent so fucking high. Can't afford to live here. But y'all gonna bring some other motherfuckers here? That doesn't fucking add up. It doesn't make no fucking sense. None. None. I'm fucking homeless. I work a full-time job. 40 hours. And can't pay to live here. How the fuck are y'all going to bring somebody else here? I understand his frustration because, and I want to say hello to Catherine. Catherine just came in. I understand his frustration because this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Look, a lot of people are struggling just to pay rent, just to pay rent here in Boston. And from what I read, I saw that they're giving them baby strollers, food. In, in cities like Chicago, they're giving out food stamps. And for people who come to me and say, well, no, they don't even have a social security number. That's not true. Yes, they do. You can look this up for yourself. They're giving them social security numbers. They're giving them things. You got people in Boston that can't even get food stamps. But all of a sudden now they have this for everybody else. Then the other thing that drives me crazy, and I'll go to you, Catherine. Why did they bring them into the recreation center into Roxbury, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Boston, predominantly black neighborhood? I don't see them bringing them into the white neighborhoods. I don't see them bringing them into the recreation center in Back Bay. I don't see them bringing them into the schools in Newton and the teachers in Newton are on strike. They're not bringing them to Wellesley. They're not taking them to Brookline. Why is that? Catherine, I'm going to bring you in. Hi. Um, first of all, I'm so sorry for being late. <laughs> um, I, I, I underestimated how long I was going to be at the last thing that I was at. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, I, for one, um, as I was telling people throughout my whole campaign for city council that me and Sean were running for last year, I'm, I have section eight. So I wouldn't even be able to afford to live here if I didn't have section eight. And, um, I mean, even even with an income, I, nobody's surviving here, even on one income. And these people are just getting hands at everything. They have shiny new food stamp cards, mass health cards, 
doctor's appointments. Um, they're actually, I saw um, a hotel shuttle driving them to doctor's appointments. We don't get these yeah. things, you guys. I had found out, I had actually found out after the fact um, through some people that I know um, that, that this person who I had witnessed getting out of this hotel shuttle, I had asked around some questions and found out that um, this person is actually in a hotel shelter uh, in, sh in a place that's like an hour away from where the hospital was that she was going to. So the government is paying shelter, uh, I mean, shuttle services to drive these people around also. And I saw that same picture of the the baby strollers. There were like 12 boxes of like $200 stroll, like nice strollers. And I mean, uh, when I had both of my kids, I think, uh, I, I was going to, um, some nonprofit program and getting like, um, used things for my kids. I couldn't even afford to get a brand new stroller or, you know, the baby equipment and books and toys. I was getting all kinds of things donated to me when I had my kids because I'm a single mom on welfare. So it must be nice to just get to go to a whole new place and get a whole bunch of free stuff. And I mean, they say that these people are going to be in this specific Roxbury shelter until May. And I'm sure that once that time comes, they're going to get put up in a luxury apartment. Well, let so. me show you this because Ayanna Presley was asked recently about it. And this is another thing that, that really bothers me too. They are really pretending like this is not an issue. Listen to what Ayanna Presley said. Sure. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with, with you, this being a humanitarian crisis at all, but just to get some clarity on this and, and sure, that's a conversation for another day, but are, do you think that the border is secure? I just, do, is that what you said? Yes, the border is secure. And we are in the midst of a humanitarian crisis that has been created by a broken system. And in the meantime, uh, we need federal investment to support uh, my constituents and those who call the MA7 home writ large, which is why we need to prevent a government shutdown. Um, I want to center the humanity, uh, the dignity, the safety, and the needs of everyone, which is why we should not have a government shutdown. It will be deeply consequential. It will create a dire situation for families, um, many that are already struggling. But if you have millions of undocumented migrants coming into the country, how is the border secure? Jake, this is not a new crisis. Um, it does require uh, more political will and, uh, and commitment. Uh, it is a humanitarian crisis. We should treat it as such. And again, representing one of the most uh, diverse uh, constituencies in the country. And in fact, I chair the House Haiti Caucus. I represent the third largest Haitian diaspora uh, in the country. And what I see on the ground is uh, community-based organizations uh, and municipalities who, who need federal support. I'm not Sean, um, you'll have to, I'll, I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, that's just, it's just completely laughable. People like Neana Presley are nothing more than the parrots to the black community to fool us. When you, if you watch the, the governor's um, speech and she had Tanya Fernandez, she had um, Lids and Miranda, and I think a reverend from the neighborhoods that represent them, they painted it as like, if we Roxburyans, people who live in the area, welcome them. People were coming up to us, they didn't even know this was what's happening. 200 people in Tanya Fernandez, um, Councilor Tanya Fernandez meeting um, earlier this week had 200 plus, and they say they didn't want this, but yet they go in the meeting, we are, Rox, Roxbury is opening their arms to these people. These are the parrots that will come up here claim that they represent us people in, in Roxbury, black people, to keep us pacified, to make this believe it. There were so many people driving by that day, honking their horns, coming by. As me and Catherine was finished, this woman came up so loud, are you the protesters? We can't be having this. Are you gonna be out here Friday? That's not true. They just lied on camera saying that we welcome these people. No, you blindsided us. Cause they know 
because this is such a poor neighborhood and we just kind of like bury our heads. We can have drug dealers, we can have gang banging, and we'll still live here and not really complain. Only a few of us would do it because they know they can get away with it. You know why that's not in the white neighborhoods? Because they will, they will rally and kick them out because this is where their money comes from. Because remember, last what was it? Last year when Ron DeSantis sent 50 migrants to Moss and Beard, they were whining and crying within the first day. And that was 50. You have more than enough homes to go do this. These, these white liberals, the progressive, love the virtual signal. Oh, everyone's welcome here. No one's, it's, it's illegal. But yet when it comes to go put your money where your mouth is, oh, we can't handle it. I, I have, I don't have enough space. It's all these excuses because they know they can dump it here. And I'm going to have to say it. These house Negroes will lie to our faces. These, these, these so-called leaders will sit there, pacify us. Tell the, the whole world we're welcoming arms. I was looking at that meeting. I, I cannot believe that we vote for these people. And they're obviously they're not here to work for us. Their body language is telling you, you're telling a lie to Roxbury. We're going to swallow it up. And uh, guess what? If me and Catherine don't go down there with, a, with our friends to go protest, this is going to be swept right under the rug until they're ready to move these people out probably in a year or two. And Catherine is correct. All these new homes, it's not for us. The only housing crisis that we have is affordability crisis. And as soon as these homes are built up, me and you are not going to be able to afford this place. We are going to be paying it out of our tax dollars for these illegals to live at. And I also want to make it very clear, Boston is full and Maura Healy has already wasted $1.5 billion on these illegals. That's, and then we're, we're getting services cut for the people of Massachusetts. And on top of that, she slapped us in the face by giving her cabinet $15,000 raises. Federal this aid will... Is, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. This is... It. The other thing I, I want to say, too, because I think... I mean, people who are familiar with the show know, again, my my issue is not with the migrants. They wouldn't be even coming here if it wasn't for the foreign policy decisions that our U.S. government made. My problem is that when we ask for these things to be given to the people who actually lived in those communities, the response is always, we don't have the funding or we don't have enough funds. And to be clear for people who are not aware, this didn't just happen under Maura Healy. This also happened under Governor Baker, who was a Republican. So it's not even a Democrat Republican issue anymore. It's just so the fact that now the numbers have increased to the point where we just don't have any more room. We don't have the space. And we have Michelle, Mayor Wu, she's the mayor of Boston. Listen to what she said. So at one point she was pushing back on this, but apparently she got in line. Listen to this. We need to continue pressure on the federal government. Um, tomorrow I'm in DC as part of that, um, as part of the visit, I'm spending some time with Secretary Majorcus of the Department of Homeland Security to echo the governor's call for more resources and um, updates on the bigger picture because we saw the chart that the state presented on that Friday Zoom to community of, at first, it took five months for uh, a 1,000 new residents to come to the, the Commonwealth, and then it was two months for the next 1,000 residents, and then it was a month for the next 1,000 residents, um, and that pace doesn't show any signs of letting up. We need... Hold on, let me address something um, really quick. Uh, from Ninja, Sabi, I agree the U.S. needs to take care of U.S. folk, but you showcasing a lot of ignorant hate right now. I don't know if you know how to listen or open your ears because I've made it very clear. My problem is not with the migrants. My problem is the fact that our government is, use, is choosing to do things for them that they will not do for poor black people in those damn neighborhoods. And you don't live here. And I want to make something very clear. You don't know what it's like to be pushed out. How many neighborhoods, and Tia can, can attest to this as well, how many neighborhoods have black people been pushed out of Boston just because of gentrification alone? And now you have this issue. So no, we should not be pushed to the bottom of the list every damn time. I get tired of it. If your feelings are hurt, Ninja, you go home and cry, okay? You ain't got to stick around here. You go home and cry. It's really easy. It's really interesting to me when people who do not deal with this at all. For the people like Michelle Wu and Governor Healy, 
who made the statements and saying, we got to get the kids into the schools. Did they sit down and talk to the teachers that teach at the schools at Roxbury and ask them if they have the bandwidth to take on more students? These schools are under-resourced and underfunded. And you guys wonder why people are leaving the teaching profession. Roxbury is not in a rich area. It is not an upper middle class area. It is a poor neighborhood in this city where people have been marginalized and they don't have the resources at those schools to take in more kids. The teachers need help. They've been asking for help. Did they ask anybody? No, they didn't ask anybody. So go somewhere. Sorry, Sean. T is familiar with it. Let me bring back in um, Catherine here. So that was the statement from Mayor Michelle Wu. This issue with the rec center, T, I want to bring you back in because you actually had an, another issue at Bromley Heath, which is now the Mil Mildred Healy uh, complex. The city tore down your rec center. And so here we go again. And, and I said this before, I'm sorry. I get tired of people saying these kids need to find something to do. Then you, you tear down the rec centers in the damn communities. Now you got damn a rec center in Rockbury and the kids can't use the center. What do you want these kids to do? Then you got the police going around in the neighborhoods, harassing the kids and asking them where you think you're going, why you're not at home. Go ahead, Tia. I think you kind of did did my job, Sabby. But you know, anyway, um, yeah. Basically, that's kind of that was kind of the thing that happened here over at Bromley Heath, now known as the Mildred C. Haley. Um, was that you know we had um, basically you know um, a rec uh, a community center in which basically we had a whole lot of programs that were you know kind of like supporting kind of like people who had. Um, who are low income, basically feeding people who kind of didn't have enough um, money for food. And basically, you know, even we had basically, you know, like we even had, you know, sports programs and everything's for the kids and everything. But, you know, everything changed when the Boston Housing Authority attacked, basically took everything over, made it where, you know, the, the residents couldn't get couldn't basically, you know, get access to the resources and or basically to even use the community center and then basically, you know, basically just tore it, basically just tore it down. I mean, it, right now there's basically, it's basically a hole with basically a bunch of beams in it right now. And kind of like when I, when I was um, looking over the article talking about, you know, so like the fact that they're using um, the, the cast recreation center as kind of like, you know, the, as a shelter and everything and how, you know, they've taken away, um, basically, you know, the ability for like kids to basically to do, um, to basically do their athletic programs and everything. And it's ch transferring everything over to the, to the Reggie Lewis center, which, you know, anyone who's been by the Reggie Lewis center know that it's constantly busy. So it's like, you know, you're taking all of the programs over here and saying, oh, well, They'll probably get their 30 minutes or something squeeze into the Reggie Lewis. No big, but, you know, that's just going to make it where, you know, kind of like, you know, that the kids of the kids of Roxbury and, and all of the other in all of the close by areas are now going to have to compete with kind of like the high schoolers, the colleges, the, the um, athletic, the athletes that come from basically outside of the city and all that other stuff. It's like, you know kind of like, you know, is we're full. We're full. Mm -hmm. Pastor John Wheeler mm -hmm. said, don't forget, Sabby, they closed half of our middle schools. These are the things that people don't see. And you mentioned the kids. So this is one of the things. There were signs outside that said Boston is full. Our kids come last. Why? Because the reality is now they can't use the recreation. So you'll see here, this is someone who is anti Michelle Wu said the Boston United Track and Cross Country Club, P uh, excuse me, picture below is one of several groups that no longer has a place to meet because Massachusetts Governor Healy and Mayor Wu decided that housing illegal immigrants inside their rec center was more important. So these kids, where are they supposed to go? You know, it just... The, this is is the thing that, that really bothers me. And guys, like I said, this is not just a Boston issue. Chicago, New York, 
I just saw an article that said Detroit now. So the thing is, is that, again, I want to say this again. My issue is not with the migrants. My issue is the fact that we have people in these poor and low income neighborhoods that are now being even more disenfranchised and being pushed out because of these decisions. And this is not right. And I don't know what more Healy's going to do. Uh, she's doing her little her crying. But there's this, too, I want to show you guys, because I don't know if you saw this because I had to have some words with Mario earlier because he was lying. I wanted to correct this, but Walgreens is now closing another location also in, in Roxbury. So what people don't understand is Roxbury is not readily accessible in, re in reference to public transportation. It is not one of the neighborhoods that has a lot of different T stops. That's what we call the subway here, the T. So when Walgreens, when all of those pharmacies, when they start to close, now you're talking about some people from Roxbury now got to try to get on a bus to go to towns or whatever, two neighborhoods, whatever, over just to pick up subscription. Right. So what Mario stated earlier, he tried to say Walgreens stores closed due to crime in minority neighborhoods is racial discrimination. First of all, that's not why the Walgreens is closing. Walgreens actually made a statement that they are closing 150 locations in the country by the end of August 2024. But again, when these things happen, who do they usually hit first? They usually close in the low income and poor black and brown neighborhoods. So that's why I want people to understand, like, there's a lot of things that are happening in Roxbury, there's the Walgreens situation, but more so now people are being pushed out of where people can't even go into their own rec center. Like this isn't right. And like I said, if this is about resources, you guys all know that there are several neighborhoods and towns in this area that have a lot more resources and have the money and they don't even dare ask people in Newton or Brookline, can we bring them here? But they just walk all over. They walk all over people in Rockbury and Dorchester and Mattapan as if they don't matter. I'll pass it to you, Catherine. So I just wanted to bring up something from a conversation that I was having earlier with somebody. Um, the immigrants that are coming in right now, as far as I know, are from Haiti, or at least most of them. Um, I haven't heard of them coming from anywhere else lately. And I was, just wondering, it's, and, it's um, I was just wondering, um, where are the or where were the Ukrainian immigrants and the Israeli immigrants and the Palestinian immigrants from Gaza? Because there, there's if you Ukraine, just one quick there, there are, we saw the video the other day, there are Ukrainian immigrants at the border too. There's also immigrants from Belarus. Yeah. So if you look at what's happening right now, where there's literally hundreds of thousands of them pouring in, mainly from Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Mexico. So if we weren't taking in hundreds of thousands of people from these places that have been at war recently, what's going on in these other countries that's not that that's worse than war we weren't where we weren't saving people from the ukraine like the way that people are coming in right now you know what i mean they're being so, killed or displaced we just so, i just had a guy on earlier that was from that was talking about the congo they're being killed or they're right. being displaced so, but that's what i'm saying so you would think that when these wars started or when the attacks were going on in these places that we would have had a huge influx of migrants then because we would have been like saving people, right? Because that's that's what we're allegedly doing when people are seeking asylum is we're bringing them here so because they're escaping some type of danger or, um, you know, whatever it is that they're escaping from their country. But what it is is that, um, I mean, there's a much bigger picture and plan at play here that I'm probably, you probably don't want to get into all those details right now, especially since I was so late, but um, it's essentially seeming like we are 
like this is a transaction. Like we are buying people because America we, in these cities, we need, they need, the government needs to cram in as many people as possible because it's like supply and demand, right? The supply, like the product is housing. The government is profiting off of this housing. To be able to sell the supply, you need to create the demand, you know? So if they create and maintain this housing crisis that we're in and they keep it going, then it's giving them leeway to bypass all of these zoning laws to build these buildings that they're building that are getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And every other week you're seeing a new massive development with thousands of units over in Charlestown. The Charlestown projects had like less than 1500 units and they're redeveloping now. And when it's done, it's going to be 3000 units. Uh, have Thank you ever you. been to Charlestown? Mm -hmm. Charlestown cannot handle another, I mean, three, that's an extra 1500 units. So that's likely an extra 3000 people. And but Charlestown, a lot of this goes back to, yeah, a lot of this goes back to the corporations and the developers, though, because this is another criticism that I had to Mayor, uh, Mayor Wu when I told her this to her face. We keep seeing all of these condo buildings being built when we're told that you're going to create more so-called affordable housing, which never tends to be affordable for the average worker. And they basically have sold out to developers. Mayor Wu has sold out to developers. More Healy has sold out to, to developers. More Healy sold out to a couple other things too, not just developers, but that's basically who they're catering to. And if you think about all the strikes, all the labor strikes that we've had in this country in the past, uh, I say two years, and then you got the UAW, the big one or whatever. Remember when some of those strikes happened, who did they bring in to replace the workers that were on strike? They brought in people who were, uh, I hate saying illegal, but they brought in people, some of the people who were migrants to come in and do those jobs because the U.S. workers, American workers were demanding more. So what some people are starting to ask, is this a way for them to get cheaper labor? Which again, brings it all back to, I was like trying to bring it back to capitalism. There is no ethical consumption that's done under capitalism. And under capitalism, there is always a group that is exploited. And so however they can get cheaper labor, it seems like that's what they're trying to do. But I've seen so many different videos. One of the videos I saw, there was a guy, uh, just a regular white dude, who was basically being paid. They watched him just hand people off at the border, took money, and then walked off. So it, it just... it. It's almost like, notice Joe Biden is not really addressing this. He keeps saying, well, it's because of the Republicans and that's why I can't do anything. No, like this is crazy. If governors and mayors and Eric Adams in New York City has also uh, hit back with Joe Biden, if they've contacted you multiple times and they said, listen, we need some help and you're just ignoring them, what is happening here? So I, so there's so many, there's so many like things that I want to say about everything that you're saying. Um, I always say there's never enough time to talk about all the things that need to be talked about. Um, so the developers and the corporations and the government are all the same people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the government has created this like psychological trickery with us where they've made us think that it's two separate entities, the government and the big corporations, right? Because if we have an illusion of all we need to be tricked with any situation is an illusion of two different sides, two opposite things, right? Republican, Democrat, black, white, gay, straight, uh, big wealthy corporations, government. But we just need to believe that we're, there's two sides and we're gonna pick one, right? And by doing that, 
first of all, that creates the division amongst the people. Because if I tell you that I'm a Trump supporter and you are somebody who thinks that every Trump supporter is racist, then you probably don't want to talk to me because you think that I'm racist. Or if you tell me, you know, vice versa, you tell me you're a Joe Biden supporter and I don't like Joe Biden supporters, so I don't want to talk to you. And we're forever at odds with each other because we disagree on a couple of things. So we just assume that we agree on nothing and look the other way. Don't bother finding common ground with each other. And that's the best technique to, to gain control over a massive amount of people is divide and conquer. Because if we're constantly fighting with each other, we're not paying attention to what they're doing, right? So I think that uh, the corporations and the developers and the government are all the same people. And this is just an illusion that we're, we're made to believe that, that the government is fighting against the big corporations. The, mm -hmm. the government, the, when these developers come in and they're, they're giving uh, proposals for a uh, six unit building, City Hall's telling them that's too small. Like, we're not going to get enough revenue on that. We need it to be at least uh, 31 units or something like something ridiculous. That's what's happening. Developers are actually getting turned down because the projects aren't big enough. So, and the bigger buildings are causing a huge problem. Our infrastructure cannot handle these bigger buildings. The, and there's not enough parking. You know, mm -hmm. they even have like Boston has a pilot program where um, newer, newer apartment buildings that are going to be built won't allow, they won't give people parking permit stickers. So essentially like, and they don't have a parking garage. So essentially, if you're going to live here, you can't have a car. Nope. You know, so, and I mean, that's all part of the plan is for, for us to not have cars. And have you ever heard of a 15 minute city? I don't think so. So a 15 minute city is, um, it's this concept where like most of, well, all of the big cities in the world, this is like a global effort. All of the big cities in the world are supposed to be converted into smaller 15 minute cities um, come like 2030. So, what it is is that like everything that you could ever possibly need in life is within 15 minutes of your home. So, and you see it happening now, you see these big buildings that go up, they have a grocery store underneath, they have a gym in the building, they have a conference room, they have a function room, um, they have a clothing store underneath, they have a Starbucks, a Target, you know, all of these things are right there. And then you have a park at the corner, playground, running track, and literally everything that you could ever possibly need. And you're working in one of those businesses that's on the ground floor or something, you know, or you're working remotely from home. So um, because, you know, the pandemic taught us that pretty much anything can be done remotely from home. Right. So mm -hmm. it's conditioned us to like be okay with everything being on a screen and us just sitting at home and, it's, it's basically like the gradual conditioning of putting us into this small place where we don't own vehicles and we're not traveling and we're perfectly content with that because everything's just so convenient. It's like trading freedom for convenience. Kendall Square in Cambridge looks like that now yes. where they took away most of the parking and everything's just kind of like like right there. And that's that's what Kendall Square looks like now. Mm -hmm. And we Very also have easy. buildings like that in Chinatown. And we have like subtle buildings like that in Dorchester. And uh, they're going up in Southie, Roxbury. And they're going to be up all over the place. And this is like, um, it's like when you see pictures of like Tokyo and Japan. Shanghai, mm -hmm. where they have those like ridiculously high buildings and just like full of windows. And there's like thousands of units in all of these buildings. And, you know, you look at the streets and it's just all people, like no cars, you know, like you think like New York City type or like when you see Tokyo, 
it's just like so many people that the cars can't even drive through, down the roads. It's like that because um, the goal is to have zero privately owned vehicles for regular people come 2030. I can see that. I can see that yeah. happening. And, yeah. and that's, that's what the climate crisis is about. The climate well, crisis is not real. Well, I, I'm not going to get into that discussion tonight. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a lot of things to say about climate, yeah. but uh, one thing I, I do want to end with is what are the next steps uh, in, in reference to Roxbury and, and the recreation center? I mean, I know you guys said that um, they will be there until May and I'm just trying to figure out what are people like the kids in the community, what are they supposed to do? Where are they supposed to go if they can't go to the rec center? Like wh what is the, what's the next step? Maybe I'll pivot to Sean. Sorry. Uh, the next step is that's going to be on the parents. That's going to be on the community to get on the behinds of the city council and the mayor and really vocal for their voices. Those illegals should not be there. And just a quick comment to the person, the person that brought up like that was hate. This is what they do. This they, they create this, oh, well, you can't speak the truth because you're being hateful. No one says we hate the illegals. Okay. This is why we don't use the word illegal because you don't want to suggest to people that something's being wrong. That's why they use undocumented. That's why they use migrants to to emotionally manipulate you into not saying anything. Idea is just like everyone's been saying. We don't hate the illegals. We hate how they're being used and coming over here. They're just being used for furthering the gain of the government and all these special interest groups. The only thing I like, I said, out the recap is people need to go out there, be taking pictures, to be holding up signs, to be verbally out there and say, "Hey, we don't want this. This is our building. It's really not fair that now these kids have nothing where to go." Because again, I find it very funny. Mayor Wu, more Healy, they read off the same script talking about, "Well, our kids are the future. We need to provide for them." And you just took something away from them, especially for those from the inner city. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen with those boys. And those girls, they're going to be running the streets. They're going to be doing dumb ass stuff. They can get caught up in trying to impress their friends. Just like over the summer, we saw all these kids running around causing all kind of chaos. And they're not going to get punished for it. And then again, we're going to have a complete mess. We're going backwards. We need to start right, telling right. them, hey, guess what? Tana Fernandez, Liz Miranda, Michelle Wu, City Council, get them the hell out of here. Uh, Maura Healy, stop whining and crying because you are a part of this problem. Okay, we know you're taking the phone calls from Joe Biden. You're going along with his agenda because you're a part of a party. And if you don't play along properly, we saw what happened when Mayor Adams stood up to Joe Biden. He got a little scandal. This is what happened to you. You're not going to be mayor. You're not going to get that promotion to a higher position if you don't play ball with us. We all know they were selected, not voted. And if they step a foot out of line, you're not going to be even on the ballot. You're not going to get those donations. OK, again, we have Paris, we have sellouts and we need to vocally make this. We should we need to be like New York and Chicago going out there and having press conferences and putting the pressure on them. Um, I mean, right. they're scared. Remember in, in California over a year ago when they did a recall of Gavin Newsom and you saw how the party just overreacted, like we're going to lose our guy. They brought mm -hmm. everyone under the sun to, to California to make sure he got reelected. We need to start threatening them. Don't get sick, sick, comfortable. We do have the ability to recall you. Now, Mayor Wu, this is the last year, so that's not going to really matter. But for Healy, you just, you, you're just you going into your second term right now. We need to put the fear into If you want to keep your job, we can get rid of you. It just takes us to collectively come together and not just do, well, it's one or two people who are going to carry the fight. Because I'm sure if me and Catherine didn't go out there with um, Clifton Braitway, no one would have been out there saying oh, a single word and they would have gone with their plan like, oh, yeah, Roxbury, Dorchester, black people. They're not going to say a word. We're going to we're gonna get way over there because they're not going to do anything. And any of the advocates and the, um, the leaders, they're in our back pockets. Uh, really quick, um, Tia. OK, um, just to piggyback on which, what, um, what everybody was saying, like, you know, yeah, one of the things that's kind of like most disgusting about the whole thing is kind of like how, you know, the the more Healy's and the Michelle Wu's, how they kind of, you know, play, how they kind of, you know, played this entire, you know, this entire, you know, 
sad sad songs with the violins and everything about you know kind of like you know how you know the people the the um the migrants they're basically just trying to basically you know to, uh, you know get get opportunities for their children and everything but and as as we've said repeatedly this is nothing against them but the fact of the matter is is that kind of like at the same time it's all hypocritical because when you look at it basically you know they talk about these homeless families but you know at, at the same time we still have our great mayor michelle Wu, who basically you know was basically you know had made it possible for the police to just tear down um the makeshift um the makeshift um, shelters and everything for the homeless people and had basically, you know, at, at, and basically have they even made it where, you know, they're going to basically have people, you know, basically locked up in, and thrown into, and basically, you know, kind of like thrown into j jail and everything, but at the same, but at the same time, even though they're talking about, you know, they're, you know, just pouring their ha hearts out and everything and saying how, you know, we have to kind of like, like, you saying like you know you can't say anything bad about us helping the migrants where's your humanity but at the same time they refuse to basically to even extend even that small kernel of humanity to their own people and mm. and that's kind of the last thing i'm going to say before i start stuttering and kind of sounding weird sorry all right. Thanks. Thanks you. Thanks so much. And Sean just said yeah, next the schools will be used. As, yeah, that's yeah. That will that will be yeah. This is a very important thing. One thing I, I want to say really quickly uh, is this. Um, actually, on Tuesday, February six, this is uh, located at the Boston Liberation Center, one nine four Blue Hill Avenue, Roxbury. They are actually having uh, a showing. It's called Roots of the Migrant Crisis. And I think if you guys want to understand like where this all comes from, because like I said, it goes back to foreign policy. Check that out if you can. That's Tuesday, February 6th at the Liberation Center in Boston. It's Roots of the Migrant Ki uh, Crisis. This is actually being hosted by uh, PSL and it's at 630 312 Border Street in East Boston. I want to say thank you to all of you coming on. I, I still have one more story to cover, but thank you so much because I really wanted people to hear from people actually in the community. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. All right. Okay, I'll go ahead and remove you guys. All right. We got one more story to do. We still have to do the Kamala Harris story, guys. But hopefully that gives you guys some perspective about what's happening. Again, I will say this for the third, fourth time. Again, my issue is not with the migrants. My issue is the fact that our leaders, our whatever political leaders, whatever you want to call them, is that they are basically trying to find a way to divide the worker. And the way that they're doing that is like they're giving benefits to them that they're not willing to give working class people who are already in those neighborhoods who have asked for those things. And this is what they do. This is how they divide the worker. So we'll go to some of the comments, and then we'll get to the Kamala story. Um, thank you, P. Smith. The feds pay for buses for migrants from El Paso. It's interesting. I haven't heard about that. JB says, yeah, the problem isn't that undocumented immigrants getting it. The problem is that they're not giving it to poor citizens as well. This creates resentment among our among us poor citizens, it divides. Exactly. Thank you, Thomas. Naomi Klein wrote The Shock Doctrine in 2007 explaining the scam. It's a deliberate crisis so that capital can dictate the terms of the solution. Interesting. Thank you. Where's the love? Black folks, adjust your W-4 and get your passports it's time for the Democrats to lose their seats, especially the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus. The CBC is weak and they have sold us out. Thank you, Roger. Boston CBI and Massachusetts CBI, one must be a U.S. citizen to vote. I think that's still how it is here, though, Roger. Thank you for the super chat, Blue Moon Red Wine. Martha's Vineyard is a great place for immigrants, lots of construction jobs. They were actually at, there were migrants that were sent to Martha's Vineyard and then the rich white people complained. And so the governor sent them to, to Cape, to the Cape. 
Thank you, soccer. I went through Roxbury in 2005 as an immigrant from Pakistan. I hadn't seen places as run down in Karachi, Pakistan, as I saw in Roxbury. It's criminal. Thank you, uh, Roger, for this one as well. Boston CBI, Massachusetts CBI, outlaw real estate speculation and private equity of owning housing. And thank you, Sir Bikes a Lot Day. The 15 minute city was coined by Paris mayor who removed car lanes during the pandemic. This was a response to out of control smog levels and to keep people active. Claus got a hold of it. Thank you for that, Sir Bikes a Lot. We got one more story for you guys, and that's Kamala Harris. So I don't know if you've heard about this, but apparently there was an event in Las Vegas that Kamala Harris had, and apparently she was showing discrimination towards Muslims. Apparently her staff decided not to allow Muslims in. So we're going to get into this, and we're going to talk a little bit about that interview that Kamala Harris had with Katie Couric as well in reference to this situation with Israel and Gaza. So this actually took place January 27th, and this was posted on Nevadans for Palestinian liberation. Let's see what happened to these guests here. We are choosing who's going in and out of the event. I'm sorry. Why are you choosing us not to go in when we have an invite? Right, you specifically singled us out. <laughs> That's racist. Is it because we have the jobs? I'm happy to talk to so it someone is. else. It is because it is. that's clearly, I, I was is. afraid of this. You singled us out, out of everybody. What? Is that against Democrats? The whole singled us campaign? Out. That's very Islamophobic. That's very racist. I'm sorry. Are you? You guys come out. Keep coming through. We have you're an You're part invite. of the LGBT community too, right? And you're still going to kick us out? So you can see what's happening here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So here you have Democrats. You know, if if it were a Republican politician doing this, oh, the Democratic Party would have a field day with this. MSNBC, CNN, they would have a field day with this, right? But because it's Democrats who are doing it, this just goes unnoticed. I think the only people that have talked about this has been independent media. So you see what they're doing. The women who were holding the camera, he told them that they cannot come in. And they were asking, like, is it because we're wearing a hijab, right? So he won't let them in. Listen to this. Come on through. Are you serious? That's crazy. Wow. I, now I really vote. won't vote right. for Biden and Harris. That's crazy. Interesting. And you, and Whose decision is that? Las Vegas. Because we want to talk to them. Okay. Right. Whose decision was this? Come on through. You see thanks this, guys? Here. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being they're here. They're male. they're racist, Islamophobic, the obviously. And you're being racist. Get a ticket or something? They're 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 disinviting <laughs> us because we have hijabs on our heads. That's why, people. This is not a democracy. This is disgusting. Obviously, we're the only hijabi women that's kind of clear. Sorry. They're disinviting us because we have scarves on our heads. Literally. That's disgusting. I thought the Biden when we have an invitation, just like everyone else, what is the problem? By a man who's in the LGBT community, too. You're going after another group. Can they come in? They were, they were already. So the people over here are saying they were already here, right? So they're noticing that they're letting other people in, but they're not letting these two women in. Why not? It is, yes, because it is. why isn't you it? We have an invitation. No, here, don't come up with excuses because I... You are a black woman and you're coming up with excuses. I'm not for coming up. And... You see this? So here's what they're doing. They have a black woman telling them that they can't come in. So remember when I told you before, I said there's different types of racism. I said a lot of times it's easier to call out conservatives for being racist because it tends to be more overt. Well, a lot of times with Democrats, it's done in different ways. It's more covert. And this is an example of covert racism. Notice he doesn't explicitly say you can't come in because you're Muslim, but he tells them that they can't come in. 
doesn't give them a reason why. That's a covert style of racism. They're not really giving you a reason, but you know, deep inside your heart and stuff, you know what it is. This is why I say liberals do this too. Wow. I didn't, yes, I did. didn't give you an excuse. You I'm just letting said that you we're know. not being I'm letting you know but that when you clearly are. I'm letting you know that you've been disinvited from an event. Why? So you can choose. See this? Disinvited from the event. So Kamala apparently didn't want I guess Muslims in the audience at her event. Someone was asking in the comments, what city is that? That happened in Las Vegas. And here's a uh, proof here that they were actually signed up for the event. Both, both of these Muslim constituents had RSVP'd for the event, were given wristbands upon checking in and were standing in line when the Harris campaign officials denied them entry. So you can see it here. Here's um, the email from Demi Falcon. So you can see arrival instructions. It tells them what table they're going to be seated at. It says table A, right? And then you can see here's their wristbands. So, yeah. So what's interesting is here now you have a Democrat. You have a Democrat discriminating against Muslims. Remember what happened? When Donald Trump did that and all these Democrat politicians lost their mind. Remember that? Wasn't Kamala Harris one of the people that said he cannot do this? He's, you know, lost his mind and she threw her hat in the ring to run for president of 2020. And now you see them doing the same thing. This is another example to show you how these parties are very much alike. Now, wait for it, too, because it's Black History Month. So Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and all of them are going to come up with all types of virtue signaling while they give you nothing, while they give you nothing. So that brings up this issue as well. And this makes me wonder if this is part of the reason why she's not letting Muslims come in. Pro-Palestinian activists in San Jose interrupted Kamala Harris during her speech about the fight for reproductive freedom. So listen to this. I'm wondering if this is why She's not letting Muslims come in now. Either way, it's still bullshit. And so, you know, I'm you see that the administration the is working for reproductive there's, freedoms, there's, but how can that be true when the United States is complicit in the destruction of hospitals and schools in Gaza and the constant murdering? It's fire now! It's fire now! Because of Muslims, 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 because of
So she already starts off to a bad start with let's start with October 7th. Kamala Harris knows the history of the Palestinian people. She knows the history of Israel. She's very well aware. So again, anyone who tells you, I'm saying this to anybody, guys, anyone who sits down and says to you, let's start with October 7th. These people are being disingenuous, disingenuous because what they are basically saying to you, they are trying to ignore Everything that happened to the Palestinian people that brought them to October 7th. So play, play like close attention to that. Cause like I said before, this is very telling. On October 7th, we saw a terrorist organization, Hamas, commit an act of sheer brutality and terrorism when they attacked and slaughtered over 1200 people, innocent people many of them young people attending a concert. Women were raped. Her Pause. Why is Kamala Harris still telling this lie? They still have no evidence of that. The New York Times has gotten a lot of pushback, not just from the gray zone, by the way, to retract that story because they had no claims to back it up. So why is Kamala Harris still telling this lie? Horrendously so. Not I mean, all. It is all. Rape is always horrendous, obviously. But it. it the, the, the what we have the seen is some of the crimes. Well, and 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 you. You hear this? See, here comes those words. Barbarism. They bring that up again, right? You want to talk about barbarism? Let me tell you something they don't talk about, right? <clears throat> you know what was um, trending earlier on Twitter? The My Lai uh, massacre in Vietnam. That was going around, making the way around on Twitter today. You know who brutally attacked and assaulted Vietnamese women? U.S. soldiers. There was no accountability for that. Had it not been for Seymour Hersh, we probably would have never known about the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. U.S. soldiers did that. They had proof of that. They had evidence of that. No accountability, none whatsoever. Committed war crimes. These were not soldiers. These were civilians, women and children. Our country did that. Won't hear people like Kamala bring that up though. Don't want to paint that picture of the American soldier. Using rape as a tool of war, right? And so I will start this conversation by saying, and Israel has a right to defend itself. We would. And how it does so matters. We've been very clear that far too many Palestinians, innocent Palestinian civilians have been killed and that Israel must do more to protect innocent civilians. We've been very clear, humanitarian aid must flow. From day one, I will tell you, one of my areas of priority included, let's think about the day after, because- She's talking about the things that they said. She said humanitarian aid must flow. They're still blocking humanitarian aid, you guys. There is still journalism coming out and videos that have been posted that show you they are still blocking the trucks from getting into the people of Gaza. So just because you say this, Kamala, that you've been clear about what needs to happen, it is very obvious that Israel is not allowing it to happen. So what is the U.S. government going to do? You're still going to continue to fund Israel while they're starving people? And you're rewarding them with weapons and money? We must stay focused on an eventual two-state solution. Well, having said that, I want to tell you something which I'm sure you're well aware of that Bibi Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, recently said. He rejected U.S. calls to scale back Israel's military action in the Gaza Strip or to support a Palestinian state after the war, he even said that Israel, quote, must have security control over the entire 
territory west of the Jordan River, which includes Gaza. So given those positions, how can you possibly come together? How can the U.S. and Israel come together to solve this? And should aid to Israel be conditional? So, so Katie just explained to Kamala that I know you guys are saying there needs to be a two-state solution, but the leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, was saying there will not be. He does not want there to be a Palestinian state. By the way, he's been saying this going all the way back to the 70s. This isn't new. Listen to what Kamala says. I'll start with the principles that we are applying to this discussion, which we've been very clear with the Israeli government about. One, as it relates to the day after, there should be no reoccupation of Gaza. There should be no changing of the territorial boundaries of Gaza. That the Palestinians are entitled to, in equal measure with Israelis, security, and prosperity. Doesn't sound like Bibi that Netanyahu agrees with that. We're the United States of America. I'm telling you our position. So, like this, this is why. Do you see the problem? It doesn't matter what your position is. Israel is not following the rules. And nobody is stopping them from doing it. The ICJ made the ruling after the ICJ ruling. They're still running free to do whatever they want. They're still killing civilians in Gaza, which is exactly what I was afraid was going to happen. So it doesn't matter what her position is. What matters is who is going to hold Israel accountable. And we take our role in this discussion very seriously. There may be disagreements. That doesn't mean we're going to change our mind about the principles that are important to be applied to this process in terms of what a day after should look like. And those principles remain consistent. We believe very strongly, I believe very strongly, Palestinians are entitled to dignity and self-determination. We believe there must be a two-state solution for the sake of the stability in the region. We you don't believe that. Th those are Obama's words. Let's be clear, people. That was Obama's statement. And until Obama made that statement, you weren't even saying those words, Kamala. Joe Biden was not saying those words. You guys can't even think on your own. It's like you got to wait for cues from Barack Obama before you actually take a stand on something. Let's wait and see what Obama does. Those aren't your words. I believe very strongly as a first principle, Israel must be secure. That Hamas and must not be in a position to commit terrorist acts against Israel innocent people or, or the people of Israel in particular. So should aid, Madam Vice President, be conditional? If uh, the Prime Minister of Israel is stating this, should that aid not come if there's not that kind of flexibility that you're seeking? We are right now in a position of negotiating with Congress to follow through on a commitment we made for aid. And we are taking it one day at a time in terms of what is happening in the region and how we are addressing the issue. But that's where that's not answering the question where we are right now. So I don't feel like you really answered my question. I do think you, I did. Well, do you th <laughs> do you, do you, but do you think it should be conditional? I know you're carrying out. That's what, not our position right now. That's not right now. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So there you go. They don't think that aid to Israel should be conditional. They're going to give aid to Israel regardless because they are bought by these organizations that are Israel first and support Israel. They're bought by APAC. They're bought by a J Street. That is why they will not condition aid to Israel. So you don't care about this. Let's think about this, folks. If I tell you that I care about the self-determination of the Palestinian people and that they, they need to have a Palestinian state. If I tell you 
that how Israel defends their self actually matters. And there have been too many innocent Palestinian civilians killed. But then I turn around and tell you, we are not going to condition aid to Israel. Basically, I'm giving you a big F you to your face. Because if you really feel like the Palestinian civilians should be protected and that Israel should not be able to continue to slaughter them, you would not continue to give aid to Israel. When you're giving the aid to Israel, you're giving them the weapons and you're saying you can use it. You know, that's like me giving you a cake and saying, don't eat this cake. It doesn't make any sense. Here's a bag of candy. You go to a little kid and say, here's a bag of candy. I'm giving you this bag of candy, but don't eat the candy. So she doesn't care. That's not what it's about. And you can tell that from that event that she hosted where they blocked the Muslims and wouldn't let, let them come in. But people are not backing down. Today, there was a series of protest events in D.C. Activists shut down main corridor in Washington, D.C. in front of the U.S. State Department to say end all U.S. aid to Israel. And if you guys follow Chuck I Modi. Sorry, I was trying to. Oh, I did do it. And what's been interesting, and I got to give it up to the, the protesters, because even during the winter, the protests have continued. So I got to give props to the protesters, you guys. I was not going to do call-in tonight, but I feel like I, I should. I feel like I should after everything. There's a pretty interesting conversations today. Um, but long story short, I hope what that showed you is that, again, there isn't that much difference from Democrats and Republicans. And that's what I wanted you to see. They both do similar things. They just do it in different ways. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back and we can do call in. Oh, I oh, think you're there muted. We go. There you go. All right. Sabby's catching me on the hop here. All of a sudden she uh, she says, oh, I'm going to do call in. And so, yes, we're going to do Colin. So I think she's going to be uh, setting up the call-in room tonight. We can hear what uh, what you all got to say. Yeah, let me see. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty uh, pretty interesting interview. You know, uh, one of the things I've been um, noticing. Here, let me check my levels. All right, yeah, that looks pretty good. Well, you know, actually, I can push my level. That ain't it. I can push. Because yeah, so we can do these adjustments sometimes in Streamyard where we um where we we mess with levels and try to boost them up, and sometimes it works. <laughs> All right, yeah, but that was a, a pretty interesting conversation. And one of the things that you know maybe we can talk about in calling is that um, um is that uh, people should also be coming with with real solutions, you know, and that's. You know, and and if your if your solution is that we should, uh, if your solution is that we should elect Donald Trump, you know, then I don't I don't know that you have very good solutions. So um, let's see what we got happening here in the in the chat. I saw one. Uh, I saw one. Here we go. Yeah. So Dennis was saying, could someone in one of these interviews please ask Kamala, are you high right now? <laughs> I haven't smoked weed in years, but she looks really, really ripped. Yeah, it's one of those things that like no one ever uh, ever talks about is is that she she does tend to look wasted and and you know I don't know I mean I guess some people just just have that that affect and and you never really know sometimes but um, yeah you really kind of get a wonder but um, but yeah let's see. What were our topics tonight we were talking about? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, we had the whole 
um, issue with, with migrants. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll echo what, what Sabrina was saying is that, you know, it's not about blaming the migrants or saying, you know, whether they're doing this or that. I mean, the real problem is that our, our whole system and, and our government is, is corrupt. And so, you know, what, what I think we should do with, with all these issues is always connect the dots and always and always connect it back over. Hey, let's see what Bad Cookies is saying. Uh, she doesn't. She doesn't have glazed over eyes, so she isn't hanging out with Hunter. <laughs> yep, there you go. Bad Cookies has got it. We'll see if we see Bad Cookies on calling. And so, yeah, like like Ubik is saying, you know, it's it's American foreign policy, and yeah, you know, that's definitely a part of, of what's happening. You know, we throughout foreign policy in the government's our government's actions. And I say our and you know, our government in a almost sarcastic way, but uh, the U.S. government's actions wrecks these countries, and then of course they they do want to come north or come here to find a better life. But then you also want to connect, you know, more dots into like what's why do we have this terrible foreign policy, right? Why are these economic systems the way they are? And, you know, to me, you keep connecting these dots, you know, it's because our, our government is corrupt and it's it's working for the, the interests of those top 0.1%, the billionaire class, the mega corporations, they, they, they're the ones calling the, the shots. And if you don't make those connections, then you just end up, you just end up kind of fl fl flailing around and people get frustrated and then they start blaming each other and whatnot. Whereas if you make these connections and I like, you know, to do the thing that the acronym I like is MCDS, money, corruption, demand, solution. So you, you focus on the money and corruption and we say that's what's, um, you know, that's what's at play here, you know, the, the MC part of it. And then then you can get to the next step, which is the demand, right? What's our what's our demand? Well, we have lots of demands like health care, you know, education housing and all these things but you really then you 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 get down to why isn't these things getting met and then you come to the big demand which is because of the corruption so you have to demand an end to the corruption and an end to to the money running everything and then you get to the solutions because then you can get to specific solutions of what you're trying to do um i'll say again we're giving uh, sabrina a little break before we jump into colin which we'll be doing soon i think she'll be setting up the room now she made her her last minute decision to um to do uh to do call in and that's good because we'll have fun in there um yeah kim is saying you got to get the money out yep you know, certainly a big agree on that. And that's a really good demand. And then it comes down to how you do that. And then we're talking about public financing and we're talking about um, banning big money lobbying, uh, banning revolving door, uh, fixing the constitution so that um, we don't have these um, uh, so that uh, we, we need to fix the constitution so that the Supreme court doesn't strike it down every time we try to, um, fix these things and have real, real regulations. Hey, Colin room is up. Okay. That it's in the chat. Um, and get the lobbies out and let's see here. I just saw a question here that I'll hit here. How are we? All right, what, all right here we go. From Mexican reform is how, how are we going to get the money out of politics? Well, Step one is to keep talking about it and to be kind of uh, annoy maybe even annoying about it and really always focus on it and be talking about the money and the corruption and demand an end to it. So you need to be saying things like we got to get the money out and then then it's the things that I was laying out there. There are very specific things that, that we can do to get the money out. And it's about things like having public financing, having strict limits on on how money gets injected into politics and into government. It didn't used to be this bad, right? You remember that, Sabrina, right? I mean, it didn't, it wasn't yep. anywhere near this bad. Um, and so- It's gotten worse you know, and worse over the years. And that can be reversed, you know, when you look at what are the problems and what's been happening. And it's just all these ways to inject money and dark money and all these things. And so there are real solutions there. You have to fix it. Um, you know, zero Joshua says Citizens United. And and yeah, you have to fix the Constitution 
so that it says money is not speech, corporations are not people. And I think we here on what I call the real left, you know, need to be really focusing on this and really laying out a vision of what a better future looks like. And a better future includes um, not having big money and billionaires and mega corporations run everything. Okay, um, let's go ahead right. and go on over to Colin. All right, we'll see um, you in the Collins. Yeah, so the link is pinned to the top of the chat. I am taking tomorrow off, you guys. I got some other things to take care of, but I will be live on Sunday. Uh, so let's go ahead and head on over to Colin. This is episode 150, Congo, the migrant issue, Kamala, and whatever else you want to discuss. You guys know how we do things over on Colin. That link is pinned to the top of the chat. So I hope to see you guys over there. Again, not live tomorrow, but I will be live on Sunday. 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Have a good night. Keep up the fight.